Okay, is it all good? Shall we start? And people on Zoom confirm? Uh, uh, it looks live now. Okay, uh, and we have the camera working? Uh, yes, we can see you. Okay, okay, good. Okay. I guess then let's get started. Let me. Let me remove this video panel. Okay, now it's much better. Great. So last time we were uh, talking about memory controllers and quality of service issues. Uh, we're going to continue in that direction today and hopefully complete. A lot of interesting ideas in quality of service, performance, memory contention in general. But before that, we had a lecture on research. Any thoughts on that? Was that interesting? We covered four papers from 2021 and 2022. How many people liked it? How many people didn't like it? <laughs> it was not interesting. Okay, we may do more of that uh, in the future, to, just to give you an idea of what's going on at the very cutting edge. Even though we discuss a lot of cutting edge ideas here uh, in lectures, uh, we clearly cannot go into everything. So this, this sort of research lectures gives you an idea of what has uh, been happening from the perspective of the authors who've, act, who've been actually doing the research and writing the papers and presenting them. These presentations that you have seen are extended versions of uh, presentations that were done at cutting edge conferences, actually. So it's an interesting opportunity to see those. And you're reading some of the papers also, so it's good to see the talks uh, together with the papers. Okay, uh, so let's uh, jump back into memory contention. Uh, we, we have a lot to cover, but just to jog your memory, uh, we've been talking about uh, essentially memory controllers over here, uh, but we're going to look at the general problem of memory contention uh, and memory contention happens clearly in many resources, as we have discussed in, uh, the, in an earlier lecture. We're going to focus a lot more on memory controllers, uh, but contention can be handled inside the controllers, inside the resources, as well as outside, as we will discuss. Uh, and we've covered several papers last time, uh, and several other papers also that I don't have here, but we talked about how memory contention can be used for denial of service, and this contention can become much worse as the system size scales. We're going to actually see some real system results from Google that is reported actually maybe this week or maybe last week, I don't remember, in the Hotnets conference in a little bit. Uh, that shows essentially this contention is pretty bad in their systems. Uh, and then we discussed how to handle the problem, uh, how to design a quality of service aware uh, system in general. And we said that there are three major things that we would like to achieve ideally, reducing inter-thread interference as much as possible so that we maximize performance, Controlling inter-thread interference so that we can enforce quality of service policies and performance isolation while providing high system performance and making the system configurable and flexible so that you can actually enforce different types of policies uh, as needed uh, and as required by the users or agreements. Right? And we, we were talking about basically two major approaches to uh, designing these systems. One is designing the resources, individual resources that you design, uh, that you have in the system as quality of service aware or smarter, let's say, be, be aware of the interference and then hope that they all together work well uh, or maybe add some glue logic so that they work well together. And the second is completely differently, uh, not really touching the resources that much, but actually uh, doing something else in the system uh, so that we can uh, reduce the interference uh, in the system, doing injection control, for example, or source throttling or data mapping or thread scheduling. And we're going to discuss both of these. We started with memory controllers, if you recall. And these were the four major approaches uh, to reduce and control inter-thread memory interference. And we were going deeper on memory controllers. So I'm going to get to this. So if you don't have to get to the lecture on other quality of service techniques today, then you can watch it. 
uh, but probably we're going to get to it. Uh, at least some parts we're going to cover, but there, there's a more detailed version of it online. And uh, hopefully we'll get to that curve also. If you don't, if you don't get, if you do not get to this curve, uh, this uh, uh, in this lecture you will see it in interconnects. But this is a very important curve that says uh, on the x-axis you have the load on the system, on the y-axis you have the latency, and basically uh, the curve usually looks like this. At some point you set the load is so high that latency is chewed up, and that's what we have kind of been seeing in contention. Uh, and we're going to talk about approaches to solve this problem. Uh, okay, memory channel partition. Hopefully, we'll get to at least this one uh, today. And we'll talk about handling CPU and I.O. interference. And this is the problem that uh, Google has been reporting in their rec recent hotness paper, as we will discuss. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, we've been talking about memory controllers. Uh, and we've talked about two ideas over here. Uh, but this is a summary of some of the things that we will talk about and some of the things we will not talk about. We call that we were talking about stall time fair memory scheduling. This defines uh, fairness as stall time fairness and try to equalize the memory slowdowns of different threads that are equal priority. Uh, and then uh, we talked about PAR-BS, uh, parallelism over batch scheduling. This was the first scheduler that tried to address the bank level parallelism destruction across multiple threads. So we're really specializing the controller to take advantage of the memory subsystem, right? As I mentioned earlier, you could treat this problem as a networking problem, but networking, you're sending data on a link, and this link doesn't have state meaning there's no row buffer, for example. And this link doesn't have parallelism, meaning it doesn't have any different banks. Uh, so that's the difference between networking and memory and storage. Uh, memory and storage is a particular structure that has locality and parallelism, whereas networking, you're really scheduling things on a link where, where you don't have the locality and parallelism. In a sense, uh, networking is an easier problem, even though there has been a lot of research on that topic. Also, it's an easier problem from that perspective. Locality and parallelism actually makes the problem much worse. And we've seen that how that interacts with the cores, right? People have been designing these techniques, out of order execution, to generate requests in parallel. And if you don't have a memory scheduler that uh, essentially tries to service the requests of cores in parallel in the memory banks, they can destroy all of the parallelism discovery that has happened on the core. So this work that we have discussed is uh, perhaps the first work, uh, as far as we know, uh, 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 to show that memory controller and cores can actually a bad memory controller can destroy the performance of an out-of-order execution engine, a good out-of-order execution engine. So you really need to make them aware of each other, maybe co-design them at some point. So this kind of goes against the, uh, what we have been discussing in this course also, right? Partitioning of how people design things. Someone designs a CPU, someone designs the uh, L2 cache, L3 cache, someone designs the memory controller, and they don't talk to each other. As a result, uh, you, get in, you get into troubles like this. Okay. Uh, I will not go into uh, a lot of detail over here, but this was a simpler mechanism. It uh, provided the idea of batching, which is an old idea. It applied it to memory scheduling, which it's a it provides a fairness substrate. And thread ranking, ranking of threads enables parallelism awareness. As we discussed, you rank the threads based on some order, shortest stall time, first order, as we have discussed. And this is based on theory, uh, scheduling theory from 1950s, so that you maximize throughput. And uh, based on, uh, and you, you, you compute this order based on heuristics in the memory schedule, as we have discussed. And this, uh, if you serve the request based on this ranking, you, uh, in all of the banks uh, concurrently, and perhaps all the memory controllers also, as we will see in a little bit, uh, then you basically increase the probability that uh, uh, concurrent requests from the same thread are going to be serviced in parallel in different banks. And that's how you enable parallelism. Uh, uh, th that's how you ensure that parallelism is not destroyed as much. Clearly, some parallelism will be destroyed, right? If you have 1,000 threads and they're all generating many requests, if, if, the, if the requests are imbalanced across the banks and they're, uh, they're also uh, imbalanced across the threads, uh, you will not get perfect parallelism as if you were running alone. But the goal here is to uh, maximize the parallelism that you exploit, uh, intra-thread uh, intra parallelism that you exploit across the banks as much as possible. Okay, uh, so downsides we have also discussed, it doesn't always prioritize the latency sensitive applications. As we said, you create a batch and uh, this batch, if you make it too big, this becomes a problem, actually, as the paper discusses. This paper is on one of the assignments that you will have if you're interested in reading it. Uh, if, a, if a thread that once in a while generates requests, generates a request, it gets delayed behind the batch, essentially. So there's some, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the size of the batch is really important in terms of how badly you treat latency-sensitive applications. But if you make the uh, latency-sensitive could be applications that are not generating that many requests, right? 
And we've also discussed that if an application is generating lots of requests, it's basically hogging the memory, it's probably not latency sensitive uh, because if one request gets delayed, it's not going to make it make, uh, matter too much for that application, right? Because that application has many requests to parallelize uh, the, uh, or, or tolerate the latency of a single request. With. Whereas if another application is generating lots, uh, a few requests once in a while, it doesn't have a lot of parallel requests that uh, can be serviced in parallel. That's, uh, that application probably has a lot of latency sensitivity uh, to that particular request, right? And to memory in, in, in general. So this is a problem, basically. If you make the batch too large, uh, latency sensitive applications can get deprioritized. If you make the batch too small, then you don't exploit robo for locality and parallelism uh, as much. Uh, and then there's this issue of scalability to many threads and heterogeneous cores that we will tackle uh, in a little bit. And this is the Power BS, Parallelism Over Batch Scheduling Paper. As I mentioned, this is implemented in some of the Samsung SOCs and maybe some other controllers, variants of it, I should say, not exactly. Usually, uh, ideas do not get exactly implemented in real systems, right? People adapt the ideas to their particular uh, system uh, and conditions. Uh, like when our out-of-order execution was first described in 1980s. Well, out-of-order execution with precise exceptions was first described in 1980s, and Intel Pentium Pro actually took those ideas and implemented them. They implemented in a different uh, way uh, than, uh, than what was exactly proposed in a paper, right? Okay, uh, any questions so far? I summarized the last lecture on this topic a bit. Okay, so let's, I, I will, uh, by the way, we also released the memory scheduling lab. So you're actually doing the memory scheduling lab uh, concurrently, hopefully, uh, with this lecture. Uh, but I will mention the key idea of one of the things that you're going to implement in the memory scheduling lab, which is Atlas. Uh, this is actually quite interesting. Here, uh, basically, we took a step back. We said, uh, okay, let's forget about fairness for some time. What should we do if we actually just want to maximize performance uh, in a system that has memory contention? Uh, with multiple threads, of course. And the main idea here uh, that is proposed in this paper is to prioritize the thread that has so far attained the least service uh, from the memory controllers. This is called adaptive per thread least attained service scheduling. And again, this is based on scheduling theory. I'm not going to go into the details of the paper. You will probably read it when you're implementing uh, uh, it in your simulator in the lab. But uh, scheduling theory uh, says that, uh, essentially, uh, uh, scheduling theory in a single server uh, queue uh, without locality, without parallelism. People have shown a lot of results. If you have many, many jobs uh, going, into the, uh, going into a single server, uh, people have shown that if you want to maximize throughput, you should uh, schedule a shortest job first. Uh, shortest job first is an, is an interesting uh, scheduling technique, right? Short, how, how, basically, shortest job first means that schedule the request that is going to take the shortest first. And in this particular case, threads, right? We we're talking about threads because we were talking about application progress. Schedule the threads that are going to take essentially the uh, short amount of time in their batch of requests first, if you think about it. That's why we had the shortest stall time first ranking. So uh, what, uh, what happens is, of course, you don't know what's shortest in a sense, right? Because uh, how do you know what's shortest while you're getting requests? If you're getting requests uh, and you don't know how many requests you're going to get, how do you predict? Uh, how many requests you get, you're going to get. Basically, uh, many people have shown that if you required more service from memory over time, that means that you're a longer job. So basically, keep, keep, look, uh, keep looking at the history. And if the history says you required less service, you're probably going to require less service going into the future. If you required a lot of service, you're probably going to require a lot more service going into the future. That's why if you calculate the amount of service a thread has received in the past, you can use that as a predictor of how much more service the thread will require into the future. And if your, job, if your goal is to minimize uh, or, uh, or um, uh, prioritize the shortest job first, then you should probably prioritize the thread that has attained the least service so far uh, from, uh, from the memory. That's the idea, basically. And this is rooted in scheduling theory, as we discussed in the paper, but I'm not going to bore you with the details. But that's the idea. This is very simple in that sense. You basically have a single counter per thread that counts how much service the thread has attained. It could be in terms of cycles. And basically pick the thread that has attained the least service so far. And we, of course, want to preserve parallelism. That's why we don't just pick the thread that has attained the least service and keep updating the attained service, but we rank the threads based on attained service. Uh, in, 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 a, in recent past time intervals. And then based on that ranking, we service the threads. 
And that's M4 straight ranking in the memory scheduler during the current interval. And if you actually do that, if you prioritize the threads that have attained the least service from memory, this essentially boils down to prioritizing light or memory non-intensive threads. And intuitively, we as we have discussed, these threads are more likely to keep their cores busy because they have one request that you send once in a while. And that one request, if it gets delayed, the core will stall. Now what we're doing is we're ensuring uh, that that, th that request will not get delayed. So that request will get serviced quickly before heavy threads requests. And as a result, uh, that core will uh, go faster and uh, uh, not stall, essentially. So that's the idea, basically. So there's a lot more in the paper. But the results also are commensurate with theory and the idea. So we basically show that Atlas is a scheduler. At the time, Atlas is the fastest, uh, highest performance scheduler. You can see the results uh, over here. These are different number of memory controllers. I think always it's 24 cores. But you can see that uh, 24 cores, four memory controllers, a reasonable system. 24 cores, 16 memory controllers is probably a very bandwidth uh, uh, lavish system, wasteful system, meaning you have a lot of bandwidth to memory. So as a result, if you have a lot of bandwidth to memory, uh, the performance benefits of a good scheduler is not that much. So you can see that the, all of the schedulers are kind of similar to each other. Uh, where the scheduling matters is when you, have, when you don't have a whole lot of bandwidth in this particular case, for example. And in the extreme case where you have only one memory controller and 24 threads contending for that memory controller, you see that the scheduler matters a lot. And you also see that the system throughput is very bad if you don't have a whole lot of bandwidth uh, to memory. So this uh, graph shows a lot of things, uh, including uh, the importance of memory bandwidth when you have a 24 core system, right? Um, okay. And then if you actually look at uh, the scaling with number of cores, it turns out uh, this sort of scheduler uh, provides uh, higher performance. If you fix the memory controller count to four, uh, and if you keep increasing the number of uh, cores, uh, you get higher and higher performance benefits. That's kind of expected, right? Because you're increasing the contention uh, in the memory again. Okay, any thoughts? Okay, so upsize, as, I mean, obviously, it's good at over improving overall throughput. Uh, compute intensive threads are prioritized. It's actually quite low complexity compared to uh, all of the prior schedulers we've discussed. This is the lowest complexity. And we will show that in a later work uh, in a little bit. This is not the lowest complexity you can achieve because it still performs ranking. We're going to deconstruct ranking also later on. Although we're going to get away, uh, get, uh, lose some of its benefits too in the, uh, when we deconstruct uh, ranking. And uh, th there's one thing that I have not discussed much, but it's discussed in the paper. Uh, the paper says that if you rank threads, if you have one memory controller and if you rank threads, okay, you, it's good for parallelism awareness. But if you have N memory controllers, more than one controller, then you should rank the threads in both controllers in the same way. Otherwise, you may be ranking some threads over here high uh, as high. Uh, you might be ranking some other threads over here high. So you're basically destroying parallelism of a single thread across the memory controllers. So this, the same problem that we discussed with Power BS happens across memory controllers also. So we're a distributed system, but you should really have the ranking across the memory controllers to be the same if you really want to preserve the parallelism in a, in a good way. And this paper shows that you could actually do that, and you could actually do that at coarse grain intervals so that you don't need to communicate the rankings much between the memory controllers. And the way the paper proposes to have a meta controller that monitors the request going to all of the controllers and per, uh, provides a ranking uh, that's consistent across all of the controllers. Clearly that meta controller is kind of a bottleneck in a sense. It doesn't do much, it just computes ranking, but uh, it needs to communicate with all of the controllers. Now you can see that memory control actually uh, issues are scaling to the entire system, right? If you have thousand cores or I don't know, a million cores, how do you design a distributed system with, I don't know, maybe hundred memory controllers and each memory controller actually gets uh, uh, uses the same ranking. Now later we will see some ideas. Maybe maybe you don't want all uh, every thread sending requests to all of the memory controllers in such a system, right? That may not be a good idea for uh, contention across the entire system. Okay, so downsides. Actually, this the goal was not, as I said, fairness. As a result, this is actually very unfair. Uh, lowest or medium ranked threads get delayed significantly, uh, uh, so you get high unfairness. Uh, and we will see that in a little bit, especially the medium ranked threads. The threads that are extremely intensive, okay, you delay them some, uh, but they don't lose as much. But somehow the threads that are in the middle lose a whole lot because they get delayed behind many threads. And this is the paper, if you're interested. Well, I guess you'll implement it in your, 
uh, memory scheduler uh, lab. How many people started the lab? I think we released it very recently, so I don't expect many people to start. No? no? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope the labs are going well. I hope they're interesting. <laughs> there are a bunch of extra credit assignments. I don't remember if you actually put an extra credit assignment to the memory scheduling lab, but I guess you will see when you read it. <laughs> Okay, I spent a lot more time than expected uh, on this one, but uh, if there are no questions, I'm going to introduce another. Yes, please. Yeah. Sure. 26. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So light means uh, memory non-intensive. Basically, it's not generating a lot of requests. So uh, by definition, these requests, uh, these uh, these threads don't uh, have a lot of requests. So the memory controller doesn't uh, give them service, prioritize them, right? If you do least detained service, uh, it basically see uh, whenever it sees a request from the thread, it looks at the counter, uh, saying, "What is the attained service of this thread?" Not much because I have not serviced much, so I'm going to prioritize this thread. Makes sense, right? <laughs> Okay. Okay. When you implement it, you'll also see it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about thread cluster memory scheduling. Here we went back uh, to try to again get the best of uh, fairness and throughput uh, with the, all of the understanding uh, we wanted. Uh, and uh, essentially, we want to achieve both better system throughput and better fairness. And in this work, actually, we changed the definition of fairness to a more reasonable one. I'm not going to detail. This is theoretically much better. Uh, definition of fairness compared to what we've been using. It's called max. It's essentially called maximum slowdown. Maximum slowdown means you compute the slowdown of all threads compared to when they run alone on the same system, and you try to minimize the maximum slowdown. As opposed to trying to equalize the threads' slowdowns, you try to minimize the maximum slowdown. And this makes in, uh, intuitively uh, the sense is that if you try to equalize the slowdowns, you may actually be slowing down a thread that would otherwise be running fast naturally. Right? But if you're trying to minimize the maximum slowdown, you don't care about equalizing the slowdowns. Threads can be running well as long as the maximum slowdown is bound by some amount. And this is actually theoretically much better definition as some other works have proved that uh, we referenced in the paper also. Uh, so from now on, that's a better definition, basically. So uh, ideally, you would like to be here, uh, clearly. You want high performance and low, uh, better fairness. And if you look at the uh, schedulers that we have covered, Atlas is clearly biased towards system throughput. RBS is actually, even though it, it tries to improve throughput, it has a fairness bias. And Atlas actually uses some, uh, the parallelism awareness of RBS, so it's built on RBS in a sense. STFM is actually out of date, let's say, at least across these workloads. So it's not on the parity, op parity optimal curve, uh, as you can see. And FRCFS is the baseline, as we've discussed, it's not good for much. And first come, first serve is actually pretty bad. And these workloads, actually, it seems like it's OK for fairness, but in other workloads, it may not be. So basically, the problem uh, is no previous scheduling algorithm provides the best throughput and fairness. And we wanted to develop a substrate uh, that can provide both of them at the same time. And the realization is that these are two very different things. If you really want to maximize throughput, you want to prioritize the less memory intensive threads, as we have discussed, right? And you rank the threads. And uh, prioritizing light threads that do not have a lot of requests to memory is good for throughput. But this is also bad for fairness because these threads that are uh, in the back or in the middle uh, starve. They get unfairly treated. You can think of these as, uh, yeah, mice and elephants, right? These small threads are mice. These, small, these big threads are elephants. And then you may have some other mid-sized animals in between. And uh, mice get prioritized, uh, but some mid-sized animals get uh, I don't know, killed by mice or something, if you have too many mice. <laughs> uh, OK, that was maybe be not the best analogy, but you can think of it that way, right? So if you take a fairness-biased approach, this, of course, as we discussed, fairness has many definitions, right? But one definition of fairness that is easy to think about is taking turns, right? You give turns to different threads. And if you give enough turns to thread C, it doesn't start. But unfortunately, if you take this approach, these light threads are not prioritized. Their turn comes way too late, even though you have only one request. Right, uh, once in a while. So you get the reduced throughput. 
So the realization is that if, if you have a single homogeneous policy uh, to treat threads, uh, that's not sufficient. And if you want to get both system throughput and fairness. So the idea is to have a heterogeneous policy to achieve best of both worlds, at least as close to uh, best as possible. And the realization is that, as we discussed, for throughput, you want to prioritize memory non-intensive threads, and you want to identify them very carefully. But for fairness, you don't want to do that for other threads that are not very light. And unfairness is really caused by memory intensive threads being prioritized over each other. Like some, some wolves get prioritized over some elephants, right? Uh, and once in a while, uh, yeah, yeah, some smaller, some bigger elephants get, some smaller elephants get prioritized over bigger elephants. You don't want to do that basically. You want to actually give them some turns. Uh, uh, and the idea over here is to shuffle the thread ranking once in a while so that each thread uh, gets to be the top thread once in a while. And uh, also, this paper goes a step further. It doesn't do the shuffling symmetrically. It, it does the shuffling asymmetrically because some threads have different vulnerability to interference. If a thread uh, will be slowed down a lot, if it uh, gets deprioritized, then, then we give more priority to that. And we'll, uh, the, the paper discussed that. I'm not going to discuss this in detail, uh, but you can uh, read the paper, and I'm gonna, I, have, I will have some slides. So that's, these are the basic ideas. The idea is separate the concerns of throughput and fairness and apply them uh, separately to different classes of threads that you identify dynamically. And the important thing over here is if you identify the threads that are going to be prioritized over all of these over here, then hopefully you're not going to impact fairness too much because these threads are really mice. They're really small threads, or maybe think of them as ants, right? They're really small. Regardless of however much you prioritize them, the other uh, animals, smaller elephants, uh, I don't know, wolves, uh, bigger elephants, they're not going to be affected that much. That's the idea. So identification of these threads is going to be important. Okay, uh, yeah, I've discussed asymmetric shuffling. Okay, so basically uh, here, it's a more complex memory controller. It groups threads into two clusters, uh, memory non-intensive and memory intensive. Uh, and it basically in prioritizes non-intensive cluster over the intensive cluster and employs different policies in each cluster. And it can also generalize this to multiple clusters, but we didn't do that. Uh, other works actually looked at uh, that a bit. Let's take a look at this clustering because it's important. Uh, at least the algorithm we used was trying to be simple. And we sorted the threads based on misses per kilo instruction. How many, uh, this is last double cache misses per kilo instruction. How many requests basically come to the memory controller per kilo instruction for each thread. And then uh, we compute some total memory bandwidth usage from these threads. And... A uh, non-intensive cluster uh, is actually, a, uh, uh, maybe you can think of this as a sum of misses per kilo instructions, and non-intensive cluster is uh, essentially uh, designated as threads that consume less than 10% of the memory bandwidth. You can think of it that way. And we look very the cluster threshold in the paper. So this is one way of clustering. It's always a problem. I mean, this sort of clustering is always not robust in general. So you may actually classify uh, a few mice here and maybe one small wolf <laughs> also over there. So uh, that's one of the issues with this sort of clustering mechanisms in general, as we will see. As other work actually that builds on it have shown. Okay, between clusters, as I said, you prioritize the non-intensive cluster because hopefully non-intensive threads have greater potential to, for making progress as we have discussed. And this doesn't degrade fairness because if you identify these threads, uh, well, they're light. They rarely interfere with intensive threads. Okay, and inside the non-intensive thruster, actually the scheduling policy here doesn't matter too much, but to preserve uh, parallelism awareness, uh, we do ranking of threads uh, like this. Lowest MPKI thread gets ranked higher. Again, the, the rationale is least intensive thread has the greatest potential for making progress. Now the intensive cluster is the harder place. Uh, basically the idea here is to periodically shuffle the priority of the threads, ranking of the threads. So you could keep doing this basically, that's the idea. And this increased fairness clearly, but unfortunately, treating all threads equally is not good enough. So you need to treat them differently because they have different vulnerability to interference, as we have also seen, right? Uh, in uh, uh, as we have also seen in uh, earlier uh, works. So I will skip this, but uh, if you read the paper, you will see that uh, this basically makes a case for some threads being much more vulnerable to interference, and in this particular case the random access thread is much more vulnerable to interference because it gets delayed by a streaming thread. And we have seen this already, actually. If you have a heavily streaming thread that basically hogs a bank, it's really destroying 
uh, whatever thread is trying to access that bank right, for some time. And this is basically showing that again. And this is pictorially showing the same thing. If you have a random access thread, uh, assuming equal number of requests, let's say, uh, you can see that the, uh, the thread distributes its requests. And normally, it has good parallelism. But uh, if you have a streaming thread, it basically keeps sending requests to the same bank for a long time. And if they're actually scheduled, uh, OK. Yeah, these are the characteristics we have seen before. If they're actually scheduled together, and somehow random access thread gets deprioritized, uh, the poor thread uh, gets delayed for a long time behind the streaming thread. As a result, it gets slowed down much more compared to the streaming thread, compared to the slowdown the streaming thread would have if random access thread uh, was prioritized over the streaming thread. That's what this figure, uh, ah, too many animations here. That's what this figure over here shows, right? If you prioritize the a random access thread, these, these are very extreme micro benchmark studies on real systems, actually. If you prioritize the random access thread over the streaming thread, streaming thread slows down substantially. But if you prioritize a streaming thread over random access thread, random access thread uh, slows down a lot more. Actually, I don't think this was a real system, uh, but you have to read the paper to figure that out because I don't remember. Okay. OK, but this is not that different from what we have uh, seen before, right? The stream application. Uh, I don't know why this is. OK. No, I have to go through the animation again. <laughs> OK, yeah, this is not different from what we have discussed before. The stream application was denying service. And this, we're actually showing that again. But this, now we're, this is making a case for uh, 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 preferentially treating some threats, uh, giving them a little bit higher priority in terms of how, how often they get ranked as a top threat uh, in this ranking system. OK, so how, basically, this paper introduced a metric of niceness of threads. And it turns out uh, threads that have high bank level parallelism and uh, low robot for locality are nicer, meaning they're more vulnerable uh, to interference. Uh, and there's a metric, and you can read the paper. Uh, so this is, this is another paper that operates based on quantum, uh, time, uh, time quantums. Uh, so uh, uh, Atlas also does this, but in the previous quantum, in a quantum, you monitor the thread behavior, memory intensity, bank level parallelism, robot for locality. And the next quantum, you perform clustering of the threads and based on that, decide which cluster to prioritize and then to compute the niceness of the intensive threads. And within that quantum, within the next quantum, you uh, abide by that clustering, meaning the, uh, uh, the less intensive threads, the non-intensive cluster is prioritized over the intensive cluster. And within the intensive cluster, you keep shuffling the priority ranking order of the threads. And the shuffling interval is actually very fine-grained, as you can see, because we do not want any thread to be, let's say, stomping on another for a long time. And this is, again, a prioritization based, like all scheduling algorithms. And this is the priority ordering. And we still keep the locality uh, row hit awareness and all this first. So all of these scheduling algorithms add uh, new priority levels, as you can see, uh, to the priority uh, 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 priority field of a request, if you will. Okay, and there's some uh, hardware cost computation, and you can see that hardware cost is not that bad. Uh, there's some hardware that you need to build, of course, for clustering, but more than hardware cost, I would say robustness of this mechanism is not easy uh, to get right across many, many workloads. In this paper, we show that across some workloads it's great, but uh, across some other workloads, it's not that uh, it's not the best, basically, but it's close to the best. OK, we've already seen all of these. Let's take a look at where uh, this stands, basically. These are uh, different uh, schedulers across 96 workloads. And at least in the workloads that we've tested, TCM uh, pushes the Pareto frontier, right? Uh, and uh, it provides the best performance, uh, best, uh, best performance as well as best fairness. Now, uh, it also has other, tra uh, other benefits. Uh, one of the things that you want in a scheduler is if you actually vary the configuration parameter, you would like to get nice trade-off in the Pareto frontier. And you can see that uh, if you vary the, I think here we vary the marking cap, uh, uh, batch formation cap. Atlas, we vary, uh, I don't remember what we vary over there, but you can look, look at the paper. But we vary, in, in STFM, we vary unfairness threshold. Here we probably vary the uh, time interval, least attained service computation time interval. In FRF CFS, we vary the cap, meaning how many requests can be reordered uh, over other requests, over the oldest requests. Uh, and you can see that they're, they kind of don't, these curves kind of don't make sense, right? Uh, you don't get a nice uh, uh, throughput fairness trade-off. Whereas with, with 
thread cluster memory scheduling, if you vary the cluster threshold, you kind of get a nice fairness throughput trade-off, meaning all of these points are actually good. You may choose this point if you care about fairness. You may choose this point if you care about performance, right? A little bit less fairness, but more performance. So that's the idea over here. Ideally, you would like design mechanisms like this. Uh, and cluster thresholds are tunable knob, basically. And you can also enforce thread weights. We did not discuss this that much, but all of the other prior schedulers also had support for this. Uh, remember, one thing we said uh, was you, uh, you would like to be able to enforce thread priorities, right, or thread weights. And uh, operating system can assign different weights to the threads. And uh, thread cluster memory scheduling actually enforces thread weights within each cluster. So it does weighted shuffling, essentially, and weighted uh, uh, MPKI computation. So it, it basically, uh, if, if the operating system thinks that a thread is much more important, it can uh, influence the scheduler to actually prioritize that by assigning it a very high weight. Okay, so I think we've discussed all of these. Any questions? Yes. So MPKI is last level cache misses per instruction. It's essentially how many, cache, how many last level cache misses you have divided by how many instructions you've executed. So it's relatively easy to compute. It has to be computed, of course, from the core or from uh, out, uh, whenever the request is coming to the memory controller. That's right, exactly. Yeah, you look, look back at the MPKI in the previous quantum. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, clearly this is upsides. It, has, it provides both high fairness and high performance. It's trying to achieve best, the best of both worlds. And usually, whenever you're trying to achieve the best of world, both worlds, you need heterogeneity. We've seen this also earlier, right? We discussed latency capacity trade-off in DRAM. How did we try to achieve uh, um, the best of both worlds? We basically talked about tiered latency DRAM, which is a heterogeneous substrate. Right? Or you have heterogeneous banks, for example. That's another substrate, heterogeneous subarrays, we've also discussed that. And we will discuss that more. It caters to the needs for different, uh, different types of threads. Some threads may be latency sensitive, some threads may be bandwidth sensitive. It's trying to characterize them dynamically. But this substrate can be also used uh, by system software also, right? Maybe the system software knows a lot about threads. It can classify the threads as latency versus bandwidth sensitive. And it can assign different clusters. We did not look at that in this particular work, but in a, let's say, more integrated world, where the operating system or the, uh, or the runtime system has a lot of information about the threads, it can actually uh, tell that information to a scheduler that behaves like this, and the scheduler prioritizes those threads accordingly. It's relatively simple also, uh, but it's not as simple as Atlas, of course. So there are a bunch of downsides. The scalable to large buffer size, actually, this is uh, not easy because, actually, this is true for many of the scheduling algorithms, maybe except for Atlas, uh, minus the ranking from Atlas. Uh, yeah, these heuristics uh, become not so robust uh, uh, as you scale to, let's say, thousands of uh, requests in the memory controller. And that was our goal in a later work, which, which I'm not going to discuss, but I'm going to mention that. Uh, so robustness of clustering and shuffling algorithms are also questionable. And in later work, people try to tackle that. This is still an ongoing uh, problem, in my opinion. How to actually do this uh, robustly is a problem in general. Because if you misclassify a thread, uh, then it may actually start affecting your performance or fairness. So that boundary, that cluster threshold actually is a bit dangerous in that sense. And ranking is still too complex, actually, as we will tackle uh, in a little bit. Even though we introduced ranking, we're going to de deconstruct it, as I said. So the, uh, all of this actually, as, uh, as we discussed earlier, all of these issues uh, make me think that uh, we really need some more, let's say, a methodical approach uh, to... Uh, providing quality of service in a memory controller. And I believe machine learning can actually help a lot of these issues uh, in the end. Uh, of course, you need to, I think, have the domain knowledge to apply uh, machine learning to the problem, right? You need to be aware of everything that we've been discussing uh, to apply machine learning. Okay, and that's the uh, paper uh, that talks about this in detail. Any questions here? And it's a shorter version. <laughs> Okay, no questions, and I'll keep going. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we're going to switch uh, and rethink the problem a little bit. Because if you think about it right now, we're adding a lot of complexity uh, to the system, right? Uh, we wanted to actually take a step back and say, 
okay, this is, there's complexity and we want performance and fairness, no question about that, but we also want simplicity. Let's add another dimension and let's make this a first-class citizen in the goal. So the goal of this uh, work is actually to achieve high performance, high fairness, and as low as possible simplicity at the same time. Uh, and uh, basically uh, the realization is what I showed you, what I talked about kind of earlier, right? Uh, the application of our memory schedules that we have discussed, they monitor the thread characteristics, and then they perform some sort of ranking, and then they enforce the ranks in the memory scheduler. And ranking, this enforcing the ranking is actually not simple in the memory schedule. And this paper actually provides some uh, real uh, analysis, as you will see, using RTL. So this full ranking of threads actually increases the critical path latency and area and significant, uh, uh, significantly uh, with the goal of improving performance and fairness, as we discussed. Now, let's take a look at uh, these three dimensions. Uh, ideally, we should have more dimensions, but even three dimensions is not easy to think about, right? This is another reason why we should think about machine learning, I think, going forward uh, in these uh, issues. But ideally, we would like to achieve all of these, high fairness, high simplicity, high performance, as you go out of... Uh, uh, the arrows basically go uh, point to higher of each metric. FRFCFS is kind of here. These are real results, but I, I removed the numbers, of course, from the uh, things. FRFCFS is application unaware. Basically, it's simple, very simple, but it has poor fairness and poor performance. Right? Uh, okay, we already said that. These other application aware schedulers, they actually are not simple. You can see they're all different and they have different shapes. But it's definitely true that they're not simple and they're complex, uh, but they provide better fairness and better performance than FRFCFS, as we have shown. Now, the question is, is it really essential to give up simplicity to optimize for performance and fairness? And this goal basically identifies that it's not. It's, uh, it's one of the simplest schedulers. It's not the most fair, but it also turns out to be the highest performance, at least in the workloads that we've tested. Uh, so basically, we give up some fairness to gain a lot of simplicity, and it turns out we actually improve performance. But again, this depends on the workload. And the major uh, observation is that the first observation is that ranking is bad, basically, for, uh, for complexity. Uh, ranking is good for preserving parallelism awareness, but unfortunately, uh, it adds a lot of complexity to the scheduler. Uh, so instead of ranking, we'd like to group the threads to two groups mainly. And again, you can, it can expand this potentially, right, to levels. If you, here, the ranking, basically, if you have 64 threads, you have 64 different ranks, we're going to reduce that to two groups. But maybe if you reduce it to three groups, it's also okay, right? Uh, it's much better than 64 different things that you uh, try to rank between. And the groups are called vulnerable group and interference-causing group. And if you do the grouping right, you, pr you should prioritize the vulnerable group over interference-causing group. That's the idea over here. So this is much lower complexity, intuitively also, right? As, as opposed to 64 things, you have two things. Uh, and you get lower slowdowns than ranking. Also, uh, this is more empirical also, as we will see. But basically, this ranking is uh, intuitively, again, if you're ranked lowest, and if you keep getting ranked lowest or medium consistently, you're going to get a slowdown. No question, no getting out of this, right? <laughs> You can keep shuffling things, yes. Uh, you can try to manage things, but uh, if you don't do it uh, well, and usually heuristics don't do it well, uh, you're going to get higher slowdowns over here at some point. Whereas grouping actually can fix that. Okay, but of course, how do you classify applications to groups becomes a problem now, right? And how do you do the grouping? And this paper comes up with a completely different insight, basically. Well, a completely different way of doing it. Uh, it because we forgot about the ranking. Uh, you don't want it. Uh, the observation is not necessarily new. It's kind of what we have known before, right? Uh, but uh, basically, the observation is that if you keep serving a large number of consecutive requests from an application, that's an indicator of interference. This was a streaming application that we saw earlier, right? This was the other streaming application that we saw earlier. So the basic idea is to group applications uh, with a large number of consecutive requests as interference causing. Basically, if an application is generating a lot of consecutive requests, mark that as interference causing application and blacklist them for a while, not for too long, maybe a thousand cycles, 5,000 cycles, uh, and deprioritize these blacklisted applications. If some non-blacklisted application is sending requests, it should go over, it should take priority over blacklisted application. And as I said, clear the blacklist periodically very quickly so that no application gets denied service, even though they may be interference causing 
for a while. If an application is consistently causing interference, that's, it's going to be blacklisted again quickly. Right? That's the idea. But so that's the nice thing about this algorithm, I think. Even though uh, maybe it's not uh, uh, like it's not based on a principle of ranking, uh, it's based on some other principle, quickly and dynamically uh, adapting, <laughs> in the sense that hopefully you're going to quickly uh, clear the blacklist uh, if you have done the wrong decision, for example. Okay, so the benefits is you get lower complexity by doing this, and you get finer grain grouping decisions. As, and this finer grain grouping decisions actually gets to lower unfairness. And then maybe to our surprise, it also gets you higher throughput, uh, as we have seen. Okay, so this is ideal, as we said. Uh, so we get the highest performance this way. We get close to fairest, and we get close to simplest. So it's close to ideal, in a sense. Again, in these workloads. So let's take a look at, uh, I think I've already said this, so I'm not going to go through the details, but basically uh, these are the, in these workloads, these are the advances of different schedulers. So you get basically higher performance than TCM, but much uh, lower unfairness also than TCM. Uh, uh, and then uh, you get close unfairness to uh, these, these two schedulers. Par, so PARBS par happens to be qu quite uh, fair over here. So let's take a look at complexity because complexity is important. And we did a lot of studies to uh, design the different schedulers at the RTL level. And this is a critical path latency in terms of nanoseconds based on, of course, the technology that we designed it at. And this is the scheduler area. We synthesized the schedulers, I believe, with some 65 nanometer technology at the time. Ideally, we would like to be here. Zero latency, zero cost in terms of area, right? Uh, this is FRFCFS. So it's close to zero latency because it doesn't make a lot of uh, it doesn't consider a lot of things in its decision, right? Uh, what happened? So I think FFS cap, FRFCFS cap is on top of that almost. Very similar, basically. FRFCFS cap is capping some number of requests uh, so that you don't reorder too many requests over the oldest request, basically. So this is the critical path latency of PARBS. So it's actually pretty bad, as you can see. This is Atlas. This is TCM. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. These are not completely optimized. Uh, I mean, we didn't basically spend months to optimize each of the schedulers clearly, uh, but that's also a metric, right? If you keep spending months to optimize a scheduler, that's probably a complex scheduler. It's going to take uh, some time to verify it, design it, uh, make it work, etc. So you can see that the critical path latency of all of these schedulers is quite high, and uh, blacklisting scheduler is very close to uh, the FRFCFS scheduler in terms of both area and critical path latency. And you can uh, look at the numbers. So that's, this is the reason why it reduces complexity significantly. And there's an argument for complexity. As I said, that testing time is another argument. How long does it take uh, to test the scheduler? This is, a, this is going to be an issue with machine learning based schedulers also, I think. Can you actually get them to be closer to ideal? Uh, but I think we have to explore the space first before we figure out uh, how, how simple uh, they can be made. Any questions? Uh, what are the vulnerable threads? So basically, these are threads that, uh, so it's defined in the paper, but uh, these are threads that uh, are vulnerable to a lot of slowdown. If you delay them, they're going to slow down a lot. Yeah, that's the definition of vulnerable. And the other threads, if you delay them, they're not going to slow down a lot, but they're going to slow, if you, if you prioritize them, they're going to slow down others a lot. That's the interference causing. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's our uh, definition of basically how to cluster between these two groups. But you could also potentially come up with uh, some other metric, right? But this was our metric, simple metric. Mm -hmm. That's right, yes, exactly. It's intuitive based on what we have covered so far. But again, there could be some other things, right? Uh, that's, I, I believe there's more to do in this area. Okay, so we covered complexity. Okay, there, so there's more. There's a longer version of this paper also, uh, and you can read it. I believe this is also going to be part of the assignment. <laughs> You'll see that this is the easiest to schedule, <laughs> the easiest to implement. Okay, so before we leave uh, memory controls and memory scheduling, I would like to discuss one thing that we kind of ignored. And this uh, is important uh, because not, not all of the world is multi-programmed, right? Basically, 
the applications uh, that we have so far been considering, the threads that we have so far been considering, don't cooperate with each other. They're basically competing with each other. One thread is completely independent of another, right? But that's not true in uh, some cases. And usually uh, you, you have um, multiple threads in a given application, especially if you actually uh, uh, parallelize your application a lot, right? And in some scenarios, you have multiple multi-thread applications, right? Some applications have 10 threads running, some applications have 20 threads running, some applications have 1,000 threads running on the same system. But we're going to look at just multi-thread applications right now. So there's more uh, in another lecture, but I'm not going to uh, go into as much detail as I did earlier. And we're going to have hopefully have electron bottleneck exploration in the future, we will see. Uh, but basically, uh, if you have a multi-thread application, threads now can be interdependent on each other, as opposed to threads from different applications. So what does this mean? Threads can synchronize with each other, right? Uh, you have many, many synchronization primitives, locks, barriers, pipeline stages, condition variables, semaphores. We're going to see some of these in bottleneck exploration lecture when we're going to talk about in detail. How many people know about these? How many people do not know about these? Okay, hopefully you know at least some things, but yeah, basically these are synchronization primitives. You can basically, uh, if, you, if you need to update a data structure, for example, and if it's shared between multiple threads, uh, to make sure that the update is consistent, uh, uh, you need to lock or you need to have a critical section uh, that ensures that only one thread can update the data structure uh, at a given uh, point and everybody has to wait. So that's a lock, for example. Uh, but different uh, synchronization primitives uh, enable you to, uh, to uh, perform different types of synchronization uh, or the same types of synchronization in different ways uh, in uh, programs where you need to sh protect shared data, for example, or distribute work uh, such that uh, the work gets done in a parallel manner uh, without any conflicts, uh, without any wrong results, essentially. So uh, if you have synchronization in your program, some threads can be on the critical path of execution, but some threads are not. Now, uh, even within a thread, some code segments may be on the critical path of execution and some may not be. This is actually an interesting concept. Uh, uh, you have different threads, one thread, is on the critical path of execution because it's holding a lock that is delaying many, many other threads. Uh, we're going to see this concept more when we talk about bottleneck acceleration. But even if you look at a single thread, there are some parts of the code that are uh, delaying other parts of the code because these parts of the code may be taking long time to execute, whereas some other part of the code may be taking a short time to execute. In an out-of-order execution engine, you can execute the short time uh, independent parts uh, much more quickly. So some part of your program is on the critical path. So the general idea is somehow prioritizing these critical parts of the applications or the threads. So let's take a look at some of these uh, mm, uh, primitives very quickly. So critical sections, as I mentioned, enforce mutually exclusive access to shared data. So for example, if you were updating shared data, you lock uh, uh, that part of code that needs to execute uh, in isolation by one thread, uh, and then you unlock once the update ends. So you can see that uh, there is a non-critical part of computation and there is a critical part of computation. Uh, and only one thread can be executing uh, this critical section at a time. So this is the non-critical section and the critical section. And you can see that two threads, T1 and T2, uh, they may be both executing non-critical section. If they both arrive at the lock at the same time, one of them wins and goes into the critical section. While this thread is in the critical section, the other thread stays idle. Now you can see that this thread, uh, we've, because of synchronization, we've caused some delay. So content critical sections make uh, threads wait, and threads causing serialization can be on the critical path. We will see this concept later again when we talk about bottleneck acceleration. For example, if you somehow prioritize this critical section, make it faster, clearly the entire program becomes faster because you reduce the idleness over here, right? Okay, so barriers is another form of synchronization. It's essentially a synchronization point uh, across a, a set of threads or the all, all of the threads in the program. So here, there's a very simple example, right? You have two loops in a program. Uh, each thread executes these two loops. But before you can start executing the second loop, you have to wait for all of the other threads to finish because the second loop may require some variables that are produced by all of the threads, right? So there's a, you insert a barrier over here. Uh, and this barrier clearly delays... Uh, uh, the execution, the start of the execution of the second loop until all of the threads come and uh, finish their first loop. So if you look at this barrier, 
if you look at just two threads, uh, the computation of the loop two can start only after thread two, both of the threads reach the barrier. And if one thread reaches the barrier earlier, as you can see over here, it's going to wait, meaning it's, it's not going to uh, make it keep its core, core busy. So a last thread arriving at the barrier is on the critical path in this particular case. Makes sense, hopefully. So of course, this is a, quick, a simple example, right? Two threads. Now imagine this being 10,000 threads and you distributed work to 10,000 threads and all of them are supposed to reach the barrier at some point and they cannot continue computation until, unless they reach the barrier. And one thread is extremely fast for whatever reason and one thread is extremely slow. So the slow thread is basically dictate your overall performance. So that's the problem with synchronization. Uh, and as you scale the number of threads, usually this problem gets much worse and worse. So the reason why a thread uh, may reach the barrier the latest or very slowly could be multiple things, right? It could be a software problem, meaning the programmer did not balance the uh, work across the threads. As a result, this poor thread has a lot of work. So it chugs along. Uh, even though there's no contention in the system, fundamentally, it cannot uh, get to the barrier as fast as some other thread that is assigned very little work. This is called load imbalance. Uh, and we will see that actually in the bottleneck exploration. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. You may have seen it actually in other courses also. Uh, but this load imbalance can be one reason. Clear that problem cannot be solved. Uh, well, I shouldn't say cannot be solved. That even that problem can be actually helped uh, in, with hardware mechanisms. Like you can accelerate that. A uh, thread that is reaching the barrier last. But another reason could be uh, a thread may be delayed uh, because of contention. For example, if you're unfair in how you treat threads, uh, you may actually delay one thread consistently a lot. As a result, that thread reaches the barrier much later than some other thread. Right? So hard, what you do in hardware in terms of scheduling the request of the threads matters. That's why fairness actually matters. In this particular case, if all of the threads are equal in terms of uh, their uh, let's say their load, uh, perhaps they should be equally prioritized over time uh, so that they all reach the barrier at the same time, right? Okay, so another uh, way of synchronizing programs is using pipeline programs. Uh, this is a way of programming also, actually. Actually, all of these are ways of programming, uh, but uh, you, you can divide uh, loop iteration statically into code segments called stages. We're going to see more of this when we talk about bottleneck exploration. Let's say there are three stages, three computation stages over here. Let's call them ABC. And you execute these threads on different cores. Why you may want to, basically, the, you may want to specialize the cores for ABC, for example, or there's some amount of data that A operates on and that B operates on, that C operates on, and you may want to exploit uh, the data locality. So different instances of A in the loop, meaning different instances of A in different iterations may actually operate on the same data. Uh, so you may have good locality. Uh, so you want to execute that on a core that houses the data without interference from compute two and compute three parts, B and C essentially. So there are many reasons why you may want to do this uh, partitioning. Uh, and if you do this sort of pipeline parallelism, and it's called pipeline parallelism because basically you execute instance of A over here, instance of B over here, instance of C over here, and clearly there's some potential communication. A feeds data into B, B feeds data into C. You want to preserve the serial execution uh, even if they don't feed data to each other, you start B, uh, A first, and then do B next, and then do C next. And you keep pipelining different instances of ABC from different iterations uh, into uh, this pipeline of cores in this particular case. Right? And if you look at this, the thread executing the slowest stage, so ABC are called stages, slowest stage is on the critical path. So basically, let's assume that B is the slowest stage. Uh, this is what happens in the execution timeline, right? Uh, thread one is executing the first instance of A. Thread two is executing the first instance of B or, or the prior instance, potentially. Thread C, three is executing the prior instance of C, let's say. Well, okay, think about the steady state, right? This is executing some instance of A. C2 is executing some instance of B. C3 is executing some instance of C. Uh, the next instance of B cannot start until this previous instance of B completes because there's some resource contention over here. Even though A may have, the, the, the instance of A may have produced the result that's needed by B. And that's true for C also. The next instance of C cannot start uh, before the previous instance of C because it's waiting for a result uh, coming uh, from B uh, over here in a previous core. Even though this core is idle, it cannot execute anything. That's the idea over here. 
So basically, if you're if one of your stages is uh, taking much longer than some other stage, it's really the bottleneck. So if you can identify these bottlenecks, I think you can prioritize them somehow. Right? That's the idea. So if your memory scheduler is completely unaware of what's going on, it has it, it can make a very poor decision. Right? It can basically say, "I'm going to prioritize thread A." Why? Because it's it looks light. <laughs> okay. But we, you're missing something very important at the higher level of abstraction, which is the criticality of execution, right? So it's much more critical for performance. So it's missing some semantic information, not just semantic, but also performance information that may be dictated uh, by how you schedule things uh, and how you partition things also. So basically, that's the importance of uh, conveying this sort of information to the shared resources. And there's a much harder problem, clearly, right? Uh, the earlier problem is, uh, hard, but uh, this is a bit harder because now it requires information about identifying criticality of computation. Okay, so that's the idea here. I think I've talked a lot about this. Uh, okay, so basically you would really like to prioritize thread two and reduce the execution time of B so that uh, you reduce the overall execution. So if you reduce the execution time of A, nothing will change over here, right? Because it's not on the critical path of computation. So how do you do that? I will very quickly uh, describe a method uh, but we'll talk more about this, as we, as I said. Uh, I mean, I already said that some threads can be on the critical path of execution, some others are not. The question is, how do we schedule requests of interdependent threads to maximize multi-thread application performance? And the idea here is, as I said, it requires some cooperation between software and hardware. You need to estimate the limiter threads that are likely to be on the critical path and prioritize their requests, basically. So how is it done? We're going to discuss that later. Assume that it's done somehow with hardware-software cooperation. But you can imagine ways of doing this, right? So uh, locks are easier. Uh, if you, for example, uh, figure out a thread uh, is causing a lot of waiting to some other threads, you may have a counter uh, for each lock potentially. And you basically increment a counter saying that, oh, when I get to this lock, this thread is causing lots of waiting to other threads. So I'm going to prioritize this thread, assuming that this is going to be on the critical path, right? It's a heuristic. It's not perfect. So what do you do with the limiter threads is kind of identify them. But what about the non-limiter threads, meaning threads that are not on the critical path? So this paper shows that you should still treat them carefully because if you actually uh, be, are, are unfair in your treatment of those threads, one of those threads can become the critical threat, become a limiter threat. So that's the idea over here. Shuffle the priorities of non-limiter threads to reduce memory interference among them. Yeah, as I said, uh, we have a hardware software cooperative limiter threat estimation mechanism, thread executing the most contended critical section. Thread executing the slowest pipeline stage. It's also relatively easy to determine, actually, uh, because you may actually have some, well, assuming you have enough time and uh, predictable patterns of behavior, uh, you, you look back and you figure out the throughput of each stage in a core, and you basically feed that information to the memory controller. Now, the, the most difficult part is actually this barrier. Uh, how do you determine a thread that's falling behind the most in reaching a barrier? Again, you can use techniques for this, uh, but uh, this is not that easy. Not, not as easy as the first two, let's say. But we will hopefully discuss that in uh, a later lecture. Any questions? I'm covering some, uh, uh, some hard material, let's say. I think this is some of the hardest material so far. Yes? You mean here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you can play tricks, of course. If you if you uh, if you know that this doesn't have any dependency on B, then you can actually try to fill that in. But that requires more information, basically. That also has the downside of violating the serial execution, right? Normally, what you do is you don't violate the serial execution of these. <laughs> so pipeline parallelism actually doesn't violate the serial execution A, B, C. Yeah, but uh, I agree. Yeah, if you have more information, you can paralyze even more aggressively, but that may not be possible. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that uh, multi-thread applications uh, in later parts of the uh, this uh, course. We're going to switch kind of to computation uh, from memory. Okay. So if you actually let's take a look at a picture because, because these things are actually uh, easiest understood pictorially. I think if you look at uh, this picture over here, we have four different threads. Uh, they're 
synchronizing using critical sections, locks, and also a barrier at the end. And uh, you can see that there are two critical sections, green one and the orange one. And you can see that they, they cause a waiting for synchronization or lock. So those are the blue parts. So there's a lot of waiting going on. Uh, so if you want to look at the critical path, critical path is easy to identify after you know the full execution, right? If I have this, if I give this picture to you, you can easily identify what was the critical path, right? You basically start from the thread that has reached the barrier, the last, and clearly you know what that is, thread A. You go back, and then you go back uh, to the thread that is actually causing waiting for this thread over here, which is this one. And then you follow that path of threads that are causing waiting. And that's your critical path, basically. But critical path is much harder to identify while the program is executing online, right? If, I, if you have this picture, that's nice. And once you accelerate the critical path, some other part may become the critical path, and that may be bad or good, depending on how you handle things. So if you actually, uh, basically, the way this scheduler operates is online. So you identify limiter threads with some methods. And once you identify the limiter thread, you prioritize that limiter thread. So it turns out, once you look at this, the most contended critical section using heuristics is kind of obviously the green one, right? Green one is actually causing a lot of waiting. It caused this thread to wait, this thread to wait, this thread to wait, this thread to wait, this thread to wait. And by this time, you have good confidence that it's causing a lot of thread waiting. You don't have enough information about the orange one, but this hasn't caused any thread waiting at this point. Right? So you basically say, I'm going to prioritize the thread that's holding the critical section for uh, the green one. And you keep prioritizing. That's limited to the thread D in this particular case. right? But that limited thread changes to other threads, as you can see. right? Basically, whoever is holding the green lock becomes prioritized by the memory controller because that's the most critical uh, threat at that point. And then there's a barrier identification that's not shown over here, but you need to do that also. So essentially, if you do that, you save some number of cycles uh, in this cooked up example. Okay. And the paper shows that you actually save a lot of cycles uh, also in multi-threaded programs. I think it's 10 to 15%. Any questions? Don't underestimate the importance of 10 to 15%. <laughs> I was watching the Turing Award lecture of Jack Dongara, uh, which was delivered two days ago, I think, uh, at the supercomputing conference. Uh, and he was basically giving, giving the same message that I just said. <laughs> he, uh, he did a lot of software development for new hardware. And that's one of the reasons why he uh, won the Turing Award in 2021, I think. But he delivered the lecture this year. Uh, he basically said uh, uh, this optimization that was really important uh, bought us 20%. But 20% across many systems is actually a big uh, win in general because 20% also impacts your energy. Uh, but I would recommend watching that lecture if you're interested. It's online. It was delivered two days ago. Okay, so upsides. Uh, basically, this is actually the first work to tackle this sort of application in memory, uh, and, and the effect of memory contention among these applications, and it does improve the performance. It provides a mechanism for estimating limiter threads. We're going to delve more into that mechanisms later. Uh, and it opens a path for slowdown estimation for multi-thread applications, which is a more difficult problem than slowdown estimation for single-thread applications. It doesn't do that exactly, but it opens a path. Uh, now, the downside is uh, it doesn't tackle some things, basically. I was, I, maybe these are not downside, but limitations, right? The scope of the work is just one application. But now, uh, in real systems, you have multiple multi-thread applications. How do you actually handle them? Uh, there are actually works that built on this work that looks at it. Uh, but you, you do need to uh, distinguish between them somehow. And limited thread estimation can be complex, actually, and may not always be accurate also. When you're not accurate, basically, you're identifying some critical thread to be non-critical, which means that you're losing opportunity and you may be making the wrong decision, right? So this is actually an important problem, as we will also discuss uh, later. So this is uh, tackled by this work uh, that's a bit later. Uh, but even this work, uh, there, there's more room for improvement uh, on top of that work. OK, and this is the paper. Any questions or any more questions? And there's more information, although I did actually spend quite a bit of time over here, but there's more information in, a, in another lecture. And if you want to actually, uh, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, I'd recommend reading this work which is a general approach to identifying bottlenecks in multi-thread applications. Uh, and I believe this general approach can be applied to other bottlenecks uh, than what this paper tackles. This paper tackles, uh, again, synchronization primitives like locks, barriers, 
uh, and uh, pipeline parallel programs, but there are other bottlenecks that could be tackled, uh, right? And this is an improvement on that. Uh, it's basically taking that idea and also incorporating utility uh, on top of that because it's, uh, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, uh, this work identifies in multi-threaded applications what are the critical things. And if you're actually running multiple multi-threaded applications, how do you take advantage of that critical thread information and also the utility of accelerating an application? Uh, uh, and and the, uh, this work actually looks at multiple uh, cores. If you have heterogeneous cores and homogeneous, uh, if you have some large cores and some small cores, who should get the, to use the large core, essentially? The, those applications who would benefit most from using the large core should get scheduled over there. But then how do you decide who benefits most for that, you need criticality information, like which part of the application is critical. So actually things get complex, but it's actually a lot of fun. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, oh, who is doing the scheduling on the heterogeneous course? Like this one. So here, uh, this parallel application, this, here, here it's the memory scheduler, right? Memory controller. But here, in these two works, the goal was to actually decide which uh, large core, uh, like which application or which thread should get scheduled on which large core. And here, actually, the mechanisms are hardware software cooperative. So it's really very low level system software plus hardware. They're doing the scheduling cooperatively. You can think of this as the very lowest level of the operating system plus hardware. You can think of it as part of the runtime system, yes. It could belong to the virtual machine in the end. Yes. No. But it's not the application software. <laughs> okay. Okay, so these are some things that we're not going to cover. Uh, and I'll take a break after we're done with memory scheduling, I think. So heterogeneity is important. Uh, and this is actually causing uh, a lot of trouble. And how to allocate resources, resources to heterogeneous agents to mitigate interference and provide predictable performance is actually a big problem. The problem is actually bigger than what uh, we have been discussing. We're taking strides, but you have large cores, small cores, GPUs, hardware accelerators, and the MA engines, as we will discuss. And this is real. This is how re current systems are. Uh, how do you handle things in a heterogeneous system? Unfortunately, we don't have time. <laughs> So you can actually take a look at some of the works. Uh, it's actually a fascinating area, but as I said, we don't really have time for this. And this goes also into predictable performance because some of the accelerators like GPU, you need to satisfy a frame rate, depending on what you're running, of course, on the GPU. Some other accelerators like vision accelerator, you need to satisfy some latency guarantees, et cetera. So you basically have different requirements from different uh, cores as well as accelerators. How do you satisfy all of those? And this is a real problem actually in real systems. It's going to become even more real. So the, stuff, the, the scheduling algorithms that are employed here uh, actually use a lot of ideas that are similar uh, to what is kind of discussed over here. Okay, let me mention one thing uh, that is actually interesting, and this is relates to what, uh, the Google paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but basically this work tackles CPU IO interference. This is, a, this, is a, this, is, this is a topic that has not been tackled as much, unfortunately. Uh, let me uh, give you the idea. Uh, so basically, uh, if you, uh, IO devices also go through uh, the memory controller today. What's an IO device? Essentially, it's everything other than uh, a CPU, let's say. Even a GPU is kind of like this uh, today. But basically, logically, this is what you want, right? Process, you want to uh, have some communication through the mayor memory between the processor and the IO device, assuming that's your mindset. Because even that mindset can be questioned, right? Why should an I.O. device go through uh, the processor uh, to handle a packet, for example? That's a good question to ask. Why not have some intelligence in your uh, network uh, device so that it doesn't have to go through a CPU, right? So this is very similar to what we have discussed earlier, memory-centric computing. But this is how things are today. Basically, things go through the CPU. So you have CPU access, CPU needing to access main memory, which, which, which is what we have been discussing so far. And I.O. devices may also need to access main memory. In fact, sometimes a lot. Uh, like a storage system, uh, it needs to uh, load a four kilobyte uh, page into main memory. It's coming from the disk. And this is a very heavy access. Basically, you're copying four kilobytes of data from an SSD into main memory. It could be much larger also, right, with large pages. 
And this could be interfering with the CPU. Ideally, uh, logically, you would have separate channels. But the way it's done today is basically like this. You go through the memory controller. So you have I.O. devices that are accessing main memory through the memory controller. For, for example, DMA engine. While the processor is running some workload, the DMA engine is putting packets into main memory. And once you have enough, enough packets, it gets uh, the CPU gets an interrupt saying, OK, now you process the packets, right? Not good for very high bandwidth networking. Uh, storage is very similar, right? The CPU uh, requests some store, uh, requests some file to be accessed. It has to go to main, uh, go to, uh, it, it has to get mapped to main memory, uh, and basically, uh, the uh, the I/O device, uh, the processor sets up a direct memory access uh, channel, and the I/O device basically writes the data, four kilobyte data or whatever kilobyte data, to the memory controller into the main memory which means that it's causing interference to whatever is executing in the processor, right? And the, this processor can be actually uh, CPU, GPU. It's, it's essentially a heterogeneous system. So uh, there are two issues over here, which is high contention in the memory channel and high ping cost in the processor. So this is actually important as well. We didn't really make a big deal of it, but if you actually start connecting all of these devices through a processor that houses a memory controller, you need to add pins uh, to the processor as well. So, how do you solve the problem? Clearly, memory scheduling could be one solution. You, you try to schedule these accesses in terms of criticality, all of the ideas that we've discussed. Sure, you will have limited success. So in this paper, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, we propose a very different way. Enable essentially another channel uh, to main memory that's decoupled and isolated from the processor. Uh, basically, processor can be accessing a bank over here in main memory through one channel. IO devices can be writing data to another bank. This way, you actually parallelize the access, and there is no contention, essentially. Of course, it's easier said than done. So they call this uh, decoupled direct memory access. It requires a new DRAM design, which actually exists. Uh, I don't know if it really is viable in the, uh, uh, in the world today, but it used to exist at least. Dual data port DRAM. You can connect one port to the CPU and the other port to the IO device. Actually, another version of this exists that's, ex that's a bit uh, more expensive. Uh, you can decouple CPU and IO access, essentially. And uh, there are many applications here. You can communicate between CPU and GPU. Uh, you can do in-memory communication, and you can do memory storage communication, like page faults, IO prefetching. While the CPU is accessing main memory, uh, there's no contention caused by any of these access that try to load data uh, into the main memory, uh, so that uh, hopefully there's some communication. And we see significant performance improvement with some system-level studies. And we, we can also reduce the CPU pin count this way. I'll not go into detail. Uh, but this is what uh, things look like today, basically. Uh, a little bit more detail. So you have all of these I.O. devices uh, that, that try to write data to main memory. They go through this I.O. interface and then direct memory access engine and basically dump a bunch of stuff to the memory controller, which is already busy with everything that we have discussed, right? So that's why this kind of the system design kind of, there are good reasons for it, legacy reasons, but it doesn't make sense uh, from a really fundamental efficiency and performance perspective, right? So yeah, that's basically the main problem. And then the main memory uh, gets contended. Uh, and we actually quantify this. Uh, and we don't have actually the perfect workloads, but if, even, if, even in some workloads which do a lot of CPU, GPU communication, you see a fraction, a significant fraction of execution time spent uh, on IO accesses uh, because of this. So a significant amount over here. And there's a high cost for IO interfaces. These are some real systems. Uh, you can see the IO interface occupies 10% of the pins over here in that real system. I don't remember which ones, which you, you need to read, read the paper. In another system, IO interface is 28%. So there's actually significant pins, amount of pins dedicated for this. So uh, th these are the two problems that this work targets. And the idea is very simple, as I said. Uh, you want to enable another channel so that these uh, interface, this interface is isolated uh, from the CPU. So there needs to be some communication control because what if two requests, you, you have a request coming from the CPU going to the same bank as this DMA. So you need to be careful. You need to have some synchronization between these things. If you have two ports, you always need to have some synchronization, but that's the idea. Yes. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So that's the synchronization part. You need to have some uh, consistency mechanism. 
yeah, you need to read the paper for more details. <laughs> yeah, but that's the idea. Uh, and then, you, uh, yeah, the, you need to add some stuff for that consistency mechanism, essentially, because you need to know the requests. Okay, so that's the idea, and this actually uh, alleviates a lot of the uh, issues. Uh, I, I believe there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, frankly, in this uh, direction. I think this is another area of the... So in this, um, in, this lecture, uh, in this course, we've been discussing an area of a system that's not uh, emphasized and improved as much, memory. Right? If you think memory is not improved that much, this part is not improved, uh, is, is improved even less. Even though it's an important part of the system, right? Today, especially with high bandwidth networking, high bandwidth graphics, uh, quite uh, good storage systems that are high performance, this is actually becoming an even more bottleneck today. And going through the CPU doesn't make sense in general. So this is the paper that I will uh, end the first part of the lecture with. But this is actually uh, recently presented at Hotnets, or maybe it's being presented, I don't know. It's basically a very hot off the press thing. And these folks actually talk about that, uh, th this problem. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe read it. If you're interested, actually, you can read it. Maybe we'll put it on there. Even though it's a system-level paper, it's a characterization paper. Uh, Hotnets is a major uh, networking workshop where uh, leading ideas are presented. So it's a selective workshop where people take some leading ideas, let's say. Uh, so these folks basically say that uh, we, pre uh, we present, okay, I'll read it, I guess. We present evidence and characterization of post-congestion production clusters, adoption of high bandwidth access, this is high bandwidth access, is essentially high bandwidth networking. Uh, I don't know what's the highest bandwidth networking today. Does anybody know? Is it 100 gigabits per second? Are we at terabits per second yet? Not sure, but it's basically pretty high today. But basically, uh, this high bandwidth access links leading to emergence of bottlenecks within the host interconnect. NIC, network interface controller to CPU data path. We demonstrate that contention on existing I.O. memory management units and or the memory subsystem can significantly reduce the available NIC to CPU bandwidth, resulting in hundreds of microseconds of queuing delays and eventual packet drops at hosts, even when running a state-of-the-art congestion control protocol that accounts for CPU and host contention. So basically, this I think what, what they're saying that is memory control is important. So if you read this uh, more, I think there's, uh, there's a section that talks about memory bus-induced host contention. Uh, they, they actually write it nicely, I think. Another root cause of the host congestion is the rapidly reducing gap between access link bandwidth and memory bus bandwidth. In large servers, applications that perform large volumes of memory operations can lead to starvation of memory requests coming from the NIC, network interface controller, basically. Basically, uh, you have a, uh, let's see. Uh, you have, this is basically the memory controller. And this is your network interface controller. That's the world for them, right? That's why it's big. So this network interface controller is uh, generating requests to the IO uh, links uh, into the memory controller, as you can see. Uh, and then CPUs are also injecting requests uh, to the memory controller. And that's what they're talking about. Specifically within the host interconnect, CPUs reading, writing data to, the, to memory, share the memory bus with the NIC performing DMA operations. When memory bus is contended, per DMA latency increases for memory requests coming from the NIC. This increase leads to an effect similar to the IO MMU case, whatever discussed before. Basically, increase in latency eventually results in PCIe bandwidth underutilization and in-flight packets resulting in, in NIC buffers quickly building up. This, in turn, results in large host delays and packet drops even when host is receiving data at rates lower than the access link bandwidth. These delays and drops can result in subsequent rate reduction and link underutilization. So what this means is you may have a very high bandwidth network I don't know, 100 gigabits per second, pick that. But you're not getting 100 gigabits per second uh, uh, packet processing speed uh, on the host because you're injecting those packets into main memory. But unfortunately, you're not able to inject those packets into main memory because somebody else is accessing main memory, that's the CPU. So all of these buffers are building up because they're getting delayed. And as a result, you get packet drops in the network interface control. Network is, this is, you get packets through the ethernet over here, and you need to drop packets because all of these buffers are full. As a result, at the higher level, you need to resend those packets. And you're not, maybe, I don't, I don't remember the results in this paper, but you may be getting a fraction of the link bandwidth that you would otherwise be get, getting. So this is one of the examples, or one of the most recent examples of importance of contention uh, in real systems, in my opinion. And yeah, it's good to think about. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Yes.
Mm -hmm. Uh, that's right. I guess it depends on uh, how you design the system, right? If you actually communicate, uh, uh, so, uh, if you actually do uh, somehow have communication from the input directly uh, to the cache, for example, or some memory on chip, that's great. Now, uh, it turns out actually there's something called direct cache access uh, in existing CPUs. These folks actually, uh, I don't remember if they talked about it, but you can actually dump the packets directly into the cache in Intel systems. Intel has actually introduced it to avoid some of these issues, avoid some of the packet processing delays. But there are some other issues also. If you actually start dumping very high number of packets into your cache, it destroys your cache also, right? And you may not have enough buffering still, right? So you still need to go through memory to store the packets in some way, basically. But I think uh, that, it, you, your point is uh, important. You need to reduce the latency in these process uh, when, whenever you have uh, like time critical processing, which is an example here, right? If you want to achieve 100 gigabits per second rates, you have to be able to handle them. Uh, if you're going through the CPU, you need to have a better way of handling them. So I believe this direct, direct, uh, direct uh, decoupled direct memory access is one approach. But again, uh, I think uh, we should really have a lot more processing uh, on the network interface. So whenever you have uh, in the routers, for example, uh, I mean, routers, of course, go through this uh, internally also, but basically internally in the routers, whenever you get a packet, maybe you should really be processing at the link, right? Uh, whenever you receive the packet, as opposed to bringing it to some memory and then the, uh, waking up the CPU to process it. So the way we design, so this goes back, I think, all of this, this paper also, in my opinion, points out to the fact that the way we are designing our systems is very uh, CPU centric and memory control is clearly a part of the CPU. As a result, we're basically overwhelming our CPUs with all of these requests. If you actually distribute the processing across, then this problem may be much uh, easier to handle. Okay, uh, I kind of lied. I will finish this one because I'm not gonna talk much about, but there's a bigger issue over here, predictable performance, which kind of uh, goes to what you're saying. So this is an example of predictable performance. This network needs to get some predictable performance to satisfy some rate. That's true for GPU as well, some frames per second. Hardware accelerators as well, like audio, video, right? All of these have some predictable performance requirements. And if they're not, if they're violated, then essentially uh, users become unhappy, right? In this particular paper, Google figured out that they were very unhappy because they have this very high bandwidth network provisioned for very high bandwidth. They're getting only a fraction of that bandwidth, right? And they basically root cause the problem to the memory controller and IOMMU in this particular case. But I mean, it could be even safety critical, right? Uh, so I don't believe Google's data centers are safety critical today. Uh, so predictable performance is important and we don't have time to cover it. So I'm gonna refer you to lectures on this topic, but there's work on this topic, uh, but I'm gonna talk about this in a different uh, context, but not these. So how do, you, how do you figure out the slowdown of different applications so that you can enforce uh, some predictability? And this paper that I mentioned earlier, but we didn't go into detail is actually looking at how, to, how do you actually satisfy predictable performance when hardware accelerators need predictable performance? But again, we don't have time. Okay, so it's a great time to take a break, I think. So let's take a break until three, and then we'll continue with other quality of service approaches. Okay.
Okay, let's get started. I think it's time, right? Yeah, it's the right time. Any, any questions on what you discussed so far? Everything is good? Does that Google paper sound interesting? Yeah, I'd recommend looking at it. It's only a six, seven page paper. But this sort of paper is good to uh, look at uh, and understand what kind of problems people are facing in industry. Remember, uh, we had also mentioned that Google paper from 2015, ISCA 2015, that analyzed their data center workloads and where time is spent on their data center workloads. And they showed that uh, a lot of time is spent on what is what they call the data center tax, a good fraction of which is moving data, right? Uh, or, or two function calls, mem mem copy and a mem move. So basically, it's good to have analysis from the real uh, field uh, on the problems that they're facing. Uh, and it's good that they're publicly talking about uh, the sort of issues so that, because this sort of kind of uh, motivates further research and also kind of validates some of the past research, right? Uh, as you can see, this memory contention is a big issue. Uh, and hopefully in the future, we can think of better systems that have, at least they, that do not create unnecessary contention. Uh, on some particular resource. If CPU is the center of the world, then it's going to unfortunately get unnecessary contention uh, also, as we have seen. So before I move on to other quality of service approaches, I'll mention two uh, logistic uh, things related to the course. First is the exam date. I was asked this question. We will determine this, but it will be during the uh, session, meaning before Christmas. I think the session goes until December 23rd. We will try not to have it on December 23rd. <laughs> and may hopefully not even December 22nd, but we will see. Uh, so it'll be during class, uh, during lecture, uh, but we will announce that very soon. The second is, uh, like, how do you approach uh, doing all of the exercise, et cetera? I mean, this course has a lot of exercises, homeworks, labs. But as I also said earlier, this course is a relatively easy because... It gives you a lot of opportunity to do extra credits, right? For example, I think uh, the exam is about 30%, which is not a huge fraction. And on the exam, you'll have bonus questions, uh, possibility to. So even though the exam is, let's say, the maximum grade you can get, uh, you will be graded out of 100. Uh, you could actually get 120 on the exam. So you could actually potentially get something like that. Uh, of course, we haven't created the exact exam yet. But as opposed to getting 30% of the entire grade, you could get 36% of the entire grade. Similarly, in homeworks, homeworks is, I think, only 20%. But if you actually do a lot of extra credit assignments, like the paper reviews, you could actually easily increase that to like 40%. I hear myself. Okay. <laughs> you could actually inc easily increase that to 40%. So there's an opportunity there. I, I didn't calculate, of course, exactly. But those extra credit reviews, uh, of course, it needs to be good quality reviews. So we'll, we'll, we go over that uh, as well. But uh, it, it gives you an opportunity to really amplify your grade. Uh, similarly, uh, for the labs, uh, it's 50%. That's the biggest component. Uh, but some of them will be bonus labs. There are some bonus questions in labs. So I, actually, uh, uh, you can get a lot of extra credit. And in the past, I think in the past incarnation of the course, a very good fraction of the uh, class, uh, I mean, actually, everybody who put some effort passed there's no, <laughs> if you're putting some effort, you're going to pass, basically. Uh, uh, that's my guess, frankly. Uh, but a good fraction of the class got uh, a grade of six. Uh, and a even bigger fraction of the class got a grade of 5.5, 5.75. I know you're not here for grades, but this is something, uh, and, and I, I don't like the grade focus also, but this is one of the reasons why we actually give a lot of opportunity for you to get grades. If you, for example, are constrained in one lab, you cannot do one lab for whatever reason, you can actually do some more reviews and get uh, grades based on that. Right. Does that make sense? Okay, yes, I'll take you first. Oh, yeah, I think that needs to be announced. So can you remind Anissa, can you remind me, uh, actually Mohammed and Juan, but yeah, there will be a deadline. It will be uh, reasonably far into the future, sometime in January, I think. Uh, is it announced on last year's course website? <laughs> 29th of January? Last year, right? Okay, yeah. So you can expect something similar. 
Don't expect it in February. <laughs> that's probably late. But there will be, yeah, you'll have a lot of opportunity, basically. That's another reason why we do this, basically. I want you to you guys to learn the material and uh, hopefully understand some things that are going on in this field uh, and develop some intuition as opposed to worrying too much about the great. <laughs> yes, you had the same question or? Okay, okay, so that's answered. Okay, so. Okay, now that that's out of the way, <laughs> let's go to other quality of service approaches. So we covered a lot of memory scheduling. Actually, the last paper we covered, the decoupled direct memory access was more of a, not a memory scheduling exactly, but it's more of a DRAM design to alleviate the CPU IO contention. But there's also memory scheduling aspects in there if you read the paper. But now we're gonna switch gears and talk about these other interference control techniques. And we discussed fundamental techniques, four of them. We talked about prioritization or request scheduling a lot. Now we're gonna talk about data mapping, core source throttling and application threat scheduling, uh, I guess in that order of priority. And there's more in some other lecture because we have only one hour and I don't intend to continue, uh, well, 54 minutes to be exact. And I don't intend to continue this tomorrow. Okay, so we're gonna talk about memory channel partitioning. And we've kind of given this idea earlier. And uh, the idea here is to partition the channels, right? So if you look at, uh, oh, wait, I guess we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about source throttling a little bit. And if you have time, we're gonna talk about application to core mapping. And some of these techniques are actually employed in data center schedulers. This is a paper that kind of predates some of the data center schedulers. VMware's uh, distributed resource management system, for example, employs some microarchitecture interference awareness. If we get to it, we'll talk about that. So you can take into account microarchitectural contention at the data center level as well. Okay, so let's jump into data mapping. And this is an example of these dump resource approach, right? Basically, uh, we're going to look at not making the memory scheduler smarter, but we're going to make uh, an intelligent mapping decision across the memory controller so that the memory scheduler doesn't have to do much. But we will see that if you actually make the memory scheduler sch uh, smarter on top of this, you'll get even better uh, benefits. So you can combine the approaches as this paper shows. Okay. So basically the key observation is very simple. Uh, modern systems don't have a single memory channel, they have multiple memory channels. Uh, and if, you have, if you're running two different applications, you have a new degree of freedom, mapping the data across multiple channels. Now in most systems, uh, the data memory, memory allocator uh, when they, uh, of the operating system, when it allocates memory, it's not aware of the memory channels. So it basically allocates uh, physical pages to applications uh, in some using some algorithm, right? Using some replacement algorithm, for example. And but this is usually not channel aware. As a result, you get interference across the channels. Right? Now, if you actually are able to partition the channels between applications, you could do this, and this way you can eliminate the interference completely between these two applications' requests. So it can actually provide good performance isolation. Right? There is no interference. Uh, between these different applications. But of course, life is not that nice. You don't have only two cores and two memory channels. You really ha usually have many threads, many cores, and a small, much smaller number of memory channels, like in the works we have discussed, maybe 64 threads or 24 threads contending for four channels or eight channels. And that's true in existing systems, actually. I haven't done the calculation, but if you look at hardware threads that are running in an existing system, potentially, is much larger than the memory channel count. So you need to have some sort of partitioning mechanism uh, that partitions the threads across the channels. And uh, the, the goal, again, is to eliminate harmful interference between applications in this particular work. Uh, and the basic idea is simple. Map the data of badly interfering applications to different channels so that they don't interfere with each other. And there are two key principles that should be uh, very familiar to you by now, I think. Uh, one, uh, one principle is to separate low and high memory intensity applications. And we've seen the reason for this before, right? Because a high memory intensity application delays a low memory intensity application, especially if you're keeping the memory scheduling algorithm as first come first serve based, right? Because that's our goal initially. We're not gonna change the memory scheduling algorithm. We're gonna handle the interference just by mapping data across different channels. Uh, and you can separate low, uh, an application that has low robot for locality to a different channel than an application that has high robot for locality. And this is also based on what we have seen because a streaming application that is very high robot for locality uh, can deny service to another application that has low robot for locality as we have seen earlier. So that's the idea basically. And just to give you uh, the uh, idea, 
uh, let's assume that the red application is highly memory intensive. It generates a lot of requests. And the blue application is not that intensive. It, on, it only has one request like this once in a while. Conventional page mapping uh, or across channels is not aware of these different applications. So it may map things this way. A blue application may be mapped to a channel that a red application, the red, the red, the red, applica the red application also is mapped to. And as a result, the blue application gets delayed significantly, as you can see. And it also causes interference to the red application. Whereas if you were able to partition the channels across these different applications, then you, both applications actually improve performance in this case. Right? This is a cooked up example, sure. But this also makes a case saying that it's possible to improve the performance of both applications uh, if you have enough channels uh, to map them across. Now, of course, this also shows the downsides kind of. So you basically save cycles in both applications here. Uh, so this is the reason to separate by memory intensity. Uh, and memory non-intensive application gets delayed significantly uh, because of a memory intensive application. You can immediately see potential downsides, right? If you actually restrict the red application to this channel, what if it needs more memory? And the solution, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, you can read the paper again. This is going to be one of the uh, papers that you can get extra credit on, if you will. Uh, basically, the solution uh, is not to be very strict. You can have a preferential channel to map an application to, but if an application needs more memory and that memory is not useful to some other application, for example, then you can map uh, from some other channel, uh, a page from some other channel to this application as well. So if you're too strict, then you may actually cause even worse problems, which is page faults uh, in the memory system, right? And that's much costly compared to, much more costly compared to interface. But this is the first key insight. The key, second key insight, as we have seen earlier, is to map higher level for locality applications uh, to different channels than global for locality. Let's take a look at this example. If it's conventional page mapping, uh, you get interference between applications. And these are the requests that go to different rows. Ro there are two requests to row zero. So the red application has more robo for locality than the uh, blue application, as you can see. Now, if, uh, these are the requests buffer state, and this is a service order. Uh, the red application gets prioritized with a scheduler that employs row hit first policy. So the blue application gets delayed significantly. It has row conflicts, as you can see. And this problem is much worse, actually, as we have seen, right? Uh, it's not just two requests. It could be 128 requests or so, something. Uh, but if you separate these applications to different channels, uh, the blue application doesn't, let's say, starve. So it's, uh, you can save a lot of cycles. You may not affect red application's performance, as you can see over here. So this is the other uh, insight, separate applications uh, by robot for locality. So the mechanism of memory channel partitioning, I, I will not go into a lot of detail, as I said. Uh, the paper has a lot more detail. I removed a bunch of slides over here. But this is the high level. It's a hardware software cooperative. You profile the applications. You classify the application into groups. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, the group of applications are applications that are, that, have, that are high intensity versus low intensity. And among applications that have high intensity, do applications have higher buffer locality or low buffer locality? Because if you have low intensity, it doesn't matter as much as the paper shows. So basically, you, you form three different types of groups across applications. And you partition the channels between these application groups. So there's an algorithm that does it. I'm not going to go into detail. And you assign a uh, the, the uh, actually, this is all done in software. The software assigns a preferred channel to each application. When that application needs to allocate a page, that page gets allocated from that preferred channel, hopefully. Uh, assuming that, as I, as I said, it's not a very strict allocation. It's just a preference, right? So if, if for some reason uh, you cannot allocate from that channel and it makes sense to allocate from some other channel, then you allocate uh, because you don't want to incur the cost of a very long latency cost of a page fault. So it's hardware software cooperative. Profiling needs to be done in hardware because it requires these metrics that we discussed, right? Uh, what is the row buffer hit rate of an application? What is the intensity of an application? But everything else can be done in low-level system software, actually. Uh, you could, of course, do this in hardware as well, but uh, traditionally, the page allocation is done in software, so there's no reason uh, to uh, do this in hardware as well, because there's no reason to make this extremely fast. Uh, because one of the reasons is because we do interval-based operation. Basically, in the current interval, uh, you profile the applications uh, in the hardware. At the end of the interval, uh, the system software classifies the application into groups, partitions the channels, assigned a preferred channel. And during the next interval, 
the system software and force channel preferences based on the application. And of course, profile the applications for the next interval. So you actually change uh, the, uh, uh, an application that may be classified one way may change uh, to be some other way, assuming it accesses uh, uh, things in a different way. Hopefully it will be allocating new pages, but if it doesn't allocate new pages, its behavior may change as a result. Uh, so basically if the behaviors of an application is not stable, you may not get a lot of benefits. You may have actually enforced a wrong channel preference. That's one of the potential downsides we will see. Okay, but then the paper makes another observation, uh, which is this applications with very low memory intensity rarely access memory. And uh, if you actually do the partitioning across channels, you have, let's say, uh, 64 applications and only four channels, or 24 applications and only four channels, you may actually cause a load imbalance across the channels, right? Because some applications access memory very rarely, and you have a few of them, and you decide to allocate channels to them, uh, allocate one channel to them. This channel will not be much ut utilized much. All of the other channels will be perhaps overutilized potentially. So you need to be careful dedicating channels to some app, uh, applications that are not utilizing the channel well, causing precious memory bandwidth waste. You don't want to run into this situation. The way the paper proposes, uh, well, th th these applications actually have the most potential to keep their cores busy also. As we discussed, we would really like to prioritize these applications that once in a while access memory, and they interfere minimally with other applications. So the way the paper uh, proposed to take advantage of uh, this and uh, fix the memory channel uh, imbalance problem is to always prioritize very low memory intensity applications in the memory scheduler. Basically, don't do uh, channel partitioning for them. If you identify a very low memory intensity application, always prioritize in the memory scheduler. And for other applications, use memory channel partitioning. Any questions? So if applications change behavior, you may run into trouble, of course, and then you do channel partitioning. If, if, the, if the application then goes back to becoming low memory intensity again, so in general, channel partitioning, this sort of partitioning approaches are not as adaptive as memory scheduling approaches like we have seen because they require movement of data, right? When you actually uh, allocate a page to one channel and the application changes behavior, do you migrate that page to another channel uh, because you may, your, your, your channel preferences may change. When you, when you start migrating pages, it becomes expensive. So this paper actually doesn't migrate as much. Okay, so hardware cost is actually very, very low uh, compared to, um, it's only the profiling counters basically. You don't modify the memory scheduling logic because they're a completely different approach, right? We don't actually make the memory scheduler smart, if you will, uh, except for this particular mechanism where you prior, uh, the memory scheduler prioritizes uh, uh, the very low memory intensity applications. And this is actually a very minimal change to uh, the scheduler because you have only a single bit per request. And that request says, that single bit says uh, this request belongs to a very low memory intensity application, so prioritize this request. So that's the most important bit in the prioritization logic uh, that you take into account. So it's very low overhead that way. So that's the beauty of uh, the ch channel partitioning mechanism. You don't need to modify the hardware much. If these profiling counters already exist, then you don't need to modify the hardware at all. Right. So. Uh, this paper also does some study. Again, these are different workloads, but it shows that basically you get significant performance improvements uh, just by doing channel partitioning. And, and if you actually do integrated memory uh, partitioning and scheduling, uh, which is basically you modify the memory scheduler slightly to improve the performance of, uh, uh, no, to prioritize the very low memory intensity applications, that buys you even more performance. So that's the orange bar over here. And if you look at this compared to memory channel partitioning, uh, thread cluster memory scheduling is competitive, uh, but memory channel partitioning is slightly higher, maybe in the noise, of course, right? It may be this application set, but you can see that uh, a complicated memory scheduler uh, provides similar performance as a memory channel partitioner in this particular case. But there, there are downsides, of course, right? The downsides of the memory channel partitioner is applications change behavior, whereas memory, channel, uh, memory scheduler like TCM can adapt to that behavior change. It's not, it doesn't have to move data, basically. So keep that downside in mind always. Uh, but you can see that the integrated memory channel partitioning and scheduling mechanism provides the highest performance. Okay. That was the state, these were the state of the art at the time. Okay, I think I've already said this. So you get better uh, system performance than the best scheduler at lower hardware cost. So there needs to be more, uh, so th this, this shows that you can combine the smart resource and the dumb resource approach in a nice way. Any questions? Yes, please.
Yeah. So in terms of hardware cost, you mean? Yeah. yeah. So okay, uh, overhead in terms of uh, like uh, what are, what are you thinking of in terms of overhead? Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, that's a good question. I think the paper has some analysis on that, but it's not that much more. So I, because you do the profiling in hardware, so hardware counters are sufficient. But yes, there is some overhead, but the computational cost is not that much. So memory channel purchasing from that perspective, it's actually nice. It doesn't have much hardware overhead. It, it doesn't have much software overhead also. TCM clearly, clearly the scheduling approaches have no uh, scheduling overhead, uh, no, no computational overhead because everything is done in hardware, right? Concurrently with everything that's running in the system. But they have a lot more hardware overhead, like especially TCM, right? As we discussed earlier. So that's a good question, basically. Whenever you do actually software approaches, there's some computational software overhead. But these are simple calculations compared to what's done uh, in existing systems. You can overlap a lot of the latency. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the profiling of uh, not uh, basically the memory intensity and the robot for hit rate. Yeah, it's not said here, but, but basically if you go back over here, uh, yeah, you want, we want to separate applications by robot for locality and their memory intensity. So we basically profile those two characteristics. Make sense? Uh, I didn't understand that. So it, ju it just looks at the application. Uh, one application is allocated to one channel in this particular work, yes. But you can also extend it. So based on the characteristics, memory intensity and robot for locality, you decide which channel is the preferred channel for that application. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. So, so yeah, in this work, we don't consider that, but again, we don't hurt those applications also because they can, they can, actually, uh, uh, they can actually be allocated to multiple channels. But yes, when you, when you partition channels, there are multiple issues, right? Uh, let's go back to that fundamental picture. Oh, I guess I'll have to go back by this way. Yeah, let's go back to the very beginning, basically. Uh, so you, you have a load imbalance problem, you're right. Basically, if one application may need more memory bandwidth, right? You're restricting the memory bandwidth usage by assigning a preferred channel to that application. If it allocates pages from another channel, it will get more memory bandwidth, yes, but the, the preferences, by definition, you're restricting. So yes, there, there are downsides to this approach also. <laughs> but overall system benefits, that's the hope. <laughs> okay. We should have gone to the to a later slide. Okay. Okay, so uh, channel partitioning is also uh, employed in the real world. The uh, real world has channels. This is from, it's an example from Zurich airport. I don't remember when I took this picture, but has anyone experienced this? Basically, uh, you're at the airport and you're uh, coming out of your plane. And uh, this is one channel to enter the uh, train that goes to the plane, that goes to the gates. And there's another channel over here. And you cannot cross this gate unless you have security clearance, let's say. <laughs> uh, basically, what happens a large fraction of the time I've been at the airport is part of the train is utilized because everybody goes through this channel and no one is on the other channel. So it's an example of a load imbalance problem uh, when channels are partitioned. Uh, has anyone experienced this other than me? Has anyone traveled? <laughs> okay, maybe not that much, but this almost always happens. I've never seen these. I, I've seen maybe once the channels are utilized nicely and in a balanced way. But yeah, this is how it is. So basically you have half of the train full of people that are too close to each other sometimes and half of the train completely empty. 
So whenever we partition channels, basically you have this bandwidth partitioning problem uh, and also capacity partitioning problem, clearly. Bandwidth and capacity are kind of dedicated to each channel in this case. So if you do poor channel partitioning, you run into these issues. Now, there's a reason why they do this, I believe. I did not confirm this, but uh, for example, sometimes security personnel go through here. Uh, um, maybe sometimes some other people go through here, but clearly that doesn't happen uh, often. But for security reasons, they may want to keep this empty. So they want to isolate, but isolation is another reason why you may want to partition the channels. So, but this is my example, and this is not this has not been fixed yet over the course of I don't know seven years or so. <laughs> okay, maybe they don't care. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, as this work shows, combined interference control techniques can actually mitigate interference much more than a single technique can do. But the key challenge is deciding what technique to apply when, and partitioning work appropriately between software and hardware. So let's take a look at the channel partitioning work. So. Uh, the upside of the channel partitioning and simple memory scheduling plus channel partitioning is this keeps the memory scheduling hardware very, very simple. It combines multiple interference reduction techniques, and it can provide performance isolation across applications mapped to different channels, just like we saw in the Zurich airport case, right? If some people need isolation, security isolation, performance isolation, they go through one channel dedicated to them. Uh, and the general idea of partitioning can be extended to smaller granularities in the memory hierarchy, banks, subarrays, Etc. And other works actually have done this. People have shown, for example, in 2012 in a packed paper that bank level partitioning actually is even better because you have more things to partition across, but you have more interference, of course, once you uh, partition across banks. Once, you, once two applications go to the same channel but to different banks, uh, yes, you eliminate some amount of uh, interference, but there is more interference compared to two applications going to different channels, right? So downside is reacting is difficult if workload changes behavior after profiling. Uh, you figured out that the memory, uh, the application is low intensity. So you actually allocated one channel to them, but then the application changes behavior, it becomes high intensity. It basically ruins your channel partitioning and adapting to this is very difficult because you have to move the data and moving data is something that we don't want to do, right? Yeah, uh, overhead of moving pages between channels restricts benefits if you actually do this. Uh, and yeah. You can imagine other downsides also. But this is a paper that introduced the idea and a lot of other work built on the idea to do bank partitioning, for example. But it's very similar ideas. Uh, which granularity you do it is, uh, I think, interesting. I think it's good to do it at, the, at, this, at finer granularities, but don't lose the big picture of the coarser granularity as well. Okay, if there are no questions, let's jump into throttling. Uh, so throttling is actually uh, an important uh, way of handling interference. And this is actually how uh, interference is handled uh, in the internet also. So I'm going to talk about uh, this, but before that, let me talk about, let me uh, pictorially show this. How do we, okay, I think I know how. There you go. <laughs> so um, if you think about uh, a multi-core system, uh, you can think about the memory system like a cloud, right? This is the memory. And you have all of these sources. These are cores, and there could be many, that are injecting requests into the cores. And there's some interference that happens over here. You could design this memory to be quality of service aware, smart. Uh, but if these sources inject lots of requests, in the end, what's over here will be overwhelmed. Right? Uh, that's where uh, this load latency curve comes in. Uh, to play basically. So I don't know if people are seeing us. Can people see us? Or is there a, another way of handling this? Let me see. I cannot see myself. Oh, I, I think I know the reason why I cannot see myself <laughs> because I turned it off. So, okay, more. Okay, stop share. I think that will fix the problem. Do you know how to do this? like spotlight or something? Does anybody know? Okay, advanced portion of screen, video. Oh, no, that's not what I want to do. Content from second camera. Is that what we want? Is there a second camera? Oh. 
No, maybe this is what we want to do. Let's see. Okay. I have no idea what's going on. Can someone say? You can see me where on Zoom? But is it good? Are you sure? Okay, good. Okay, let's hope that people on Zoom see. So basically, uh, this is true for all shared resources, right? There's some load on uh, the shared resource. I'll just call it SR. And there's some latency. And this is the request latency, basically. You inject some request into the shared resource and you observe how long it takes. Right? And if and usually this curve looks, uh, well, I guess almost always this curve looks like this. There's some minimum possible latency that you can have. And then the curve is like this. And this is called the load latency curve because load on the x-axis, latency on the y-axis. And uh, basically, if you keep injecting a lot of stuff into this uh, structure, which has limited buffering, uh, at some point, uh, you saturate the throughput. So this asymptote over here is called the saturation throughput. I guess I'll call it T-put. Uh, and where, where basically you've injected so much load on the system uh, that uh, the latency uh, shoots up. Oh, is that better? Okay, I guess you can adjust, thanks. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have done content from the second camera, but as long as people can see, uh, I'm fine with it. So uh, basically you don't want to be at this point. That's, the, uh, that's my argument. You don't want to be around this point because the latencies are too high over here. So how do you ensure that you're not around this point? Well, if you don't control injection into these shared resources, it's very hard to ensure that, right? Uh, because if everybody can is free to inject and they have the capability to inject at a high rate, like we have seen in the Google paper, right? Clearly this memory controller, this network interface controller, they have the capability to inject a lot. Uh, and also CPUs have the ability to inject a lot. Uh, what happens is you will reach this point. So how do you avoid reaching this point? Basically throttle things. Uh, if you see that the load is too much, push back and tell some of the sources, do not inject or wait for some time, right? Throttle the rates at which these sources can inject. And that's the idea. The idea is basically to control the interference at these points of injection. Monitor what's going on in the system and ensure that the system doesn't get close to the saturation throughput. Maybe you have a margin like this, right? Maybe you want to stay here. Maybe even this is okay. You determine that basically. So that's the idea. That's the overall idea of throttling. And this is called source throttling. And uh, this is actually employed in the internet. Uh, basically, internet looks like this also, right? Uh, and uh, what happens is internet has some network structure and has uh, some capability. It has a load latency curve, essentially, based on the network structure. As we, when we cover interconnects, we will see that this load latency curve is determined by many things. The buffering capability over here, uh, the routing mechanisms you have over here, the scheduling mechanisms you have in the routers. Memory control is another router, if you think about it. Uh, and it has a scheduling mechanism, it has a buffering capability, and it has a fundamental interconnect topology uh, also. All of those really affect uh, this curve over here, both the minimum latency as well as the saturation throughput. So ideally, you would like to be close to the minimum latency but not uh, shoot up your latencies and have as much throughput as possible so that you are utilizing the uh, shared resource really well. So the way it's done on the internet today is basically uh, the routers, internal routers over here, have mechanisms uh, to detect packet drops, for example. If lots of packets are being dropped, you send messages back to the source saying that source throttle yourself, meaning uh, it does congestion control. This is the congestion control mechanism it's, uh, on the internet. Uh, I mean, you can apply similar principles uh, to memory systems, but at some point, memory system breaks down because it's not the internet, right? It's a bit different, as we will see in the interconnect lecture. So this is the idea, basically. Uh, this, is, this is why source throttling can be extremely powerful because it can achieve something none of the other mechanisms can achieve. It can, you can detect uh, that you're overwhelming the system and pull back a little bit. Okay, so with that, uh, let's go back to whatever we were doing. Now let's share basic. Okay, is it looking fine now? 
Okay. And the content from the camera is also fine. It's this one, right? Okay. Okay. So uh, you can apply the same principles to uh, uh, multi-core systems, and we're going to do that uh, with this work. Any questions on this, by the way? How many people have taken a networking course? Okay, so you've seen congestion control mechanisms that behave like this, right? So you're not uh, unfamiliar with source throttling then. So you can think of uh, multi-core systems in a similar way, right? You have shared memory resources. Uh, like uh, smart resources says, okay, have smart cache, smart memory controller, smart DRM banks. Uh, and uh, it may be fine. And also explicitly coordinating these mechanisms requires complex implementation. So this paper also shows that having a smart cache and a smart memory controller at the same time doesn't necessarily give you a good performance in total, in aggregate, let's say. I'm not going to talk about that. But basically it requires, you cannot just have smart memory control, smart cache, smart interconnect, and hope that everything works fine because these needs to be coordinated somehow. That's another benefit of source throttling. Uh, source throttling enables in coordinated ways. If you have an intelligent way of doing that, you can coordinate the throttling of different agents. Now, it may not be easy and it may not be possible in a highly distributed system because how do you coordinate all of the agents in a very highly distributed system? That's a tough way. But in a multi-core system on the same chip, it's an easier problem. So basically, the goal of this work is to enable fair sharing of the entire memory system, not just the memory controller, not just the cache, not just the interconnect, but all of it, uh, by controlling an interference in a coordinated manner. And it builds on source styling as a fairness substrate. And as I said, the, the key idea is to manage inter interference at the cores or sources, not at the shared resources. And it has a particular mechanism. This could be, of course, uh, designed in different ways. But in this particular work, uh, the idea was to dynamically estimate unfairness in the memory system feedback this information to a centralized controller on chip, and, and the controller throttles the core's memory access rates accordingly. Basically, it determines whom to throttle and by how much. This depends on uh, a target. Now we can configure this uh, target, right? It could be a system throughput, it could be fairness, it could be that curve that I showed you earlier, uh, like where you are in this curve, the latencies. You can actually draw, you can actually, uh, this controller can actually figure out this curve as the system runs, right? You can actually, uh, plot this curve while the system runs, and you can have an idea of what's going on in the system. So it's not that uh, hard to do because you, it's based on measurement, right? Uh, and then depending on the target, fairness, throughput, or per thread slowdown, it decides whom to throw them by how much. For example, if the unfairness in the system is greater than some system software specified targets, similar to what we have discussed with stall time fair memory scheduling, right? Then you can throttle down the core that's causing the unfairness. You need to detect that, of course, and throttle up the core that was unfairly treated. So usually these approaches, even though they do not uh, change the policies inside the controllers, like memory controller, they need some information from what's going on in this cloud. Okay, I keep bringing this up. I don't have a better way, unfortunately. It's not half of the screen. <laughs> but basically, even though you don't change the scheduling inside here in the uh, let's say pure form of, uh, oh, yeah. in the pure form of uh, uh, dumb resources, which is source throttling, uh, you have to have you have to collect information about what's going on over here so that you decide whom to throttle and by how much to throttle. Right? You need to figure out oh this this core is interfering with this other one too much, so throttle this one, uh, throttle down this one, and throttle up this one, for example. Okay, so that's the idea. And you can clearly configure this uh, with many objectives, as we will see. Brief. And this is a paper uh, that first introduced it uh, for the multi-core shared resources. So how does it work? Uh, I'm not going to, again, a whole lot of detail here, because once you try to make it work, it actually becomes ugly. <laughs> the, the theory not, sounds nice, but once you really try to make it work, you add a lot of counters everywhere in the memory system to figure out what's going on. Uh, so basically, it has two components, but it's still simpler, potentially, than modifying everything, uh, every policy in the memory system, right? So it has two components. Uh, one component is runtime unfairness evaluation, the done in hardware. Uh, it dynamically estimates the unfairness or application slowdowns in this particular case in the memory system and estimates which application is slowing down which, uh, which other. Basically, you can compute a matrix. Whenever one application delays another application in the memory system, in the cache, in the interconnect, in the memory controller, you increment a counter or increment some latency, right? This is a matrix of uh, uh, the delaying application, the interference-causing application, and the 
uh, and the, let's say, victim application. So it does it this way. So it's a bit overhead, but it's doable. Uh, and then there's an, another uh, component, dynamic request throttling uh, engine. Uh, it uh, can be implemented in hardware or software. Uh, it adjusts how aggressively each core makes requests to the shared resources. So it throttles down the request rates of cores that are causing unfairness. How does it do that? It can limit how many outstanding misses the core can have. It can limit the injection rate. You can inject only one request every 1,000 cycles, for example. Or you can inject, you're not restricted. You can inject as many requests as you want for now because you're not interfering with anyone. Or the system is not that utilized, so go ahead. Right. That's the idea. So this is basically how it operates. You have slowdown estimation of application in one interval. You estimate system unfairness. You find an application with the highest slowdown. And you find the application causing the most interference for the uh, application that's, that has the highest slowdown. And then you feed this information to a dynamic request throttling engine. And if the unfairness estimate is greater than some targets, uh, you throttle down the application that is in causing the most interference, limits its injection rate and parallelism, and you throttle up applications lowest if you can't throttle it up. So this is one implementation, of course, right? This is a, this general idea, general substrate can be uh, configured to have different unfairness definitions, uh, different ways of doing the throttling. It may not just focus on one application, but this is a proof of concept with uh, what's implemented. So how do you implement the dynamic? So how do you uh, decide uh, the unfairness evaluation? This is very similar to what we have discussed earlier, slowdown estimation. This is based on slowdown estimation. It doesn't have to be done this way, but I'm not going to talk about it in detail. You've seen that this is a complex problem, right? So this is basically uh, ch changing the slowdown estimation problem to the entire system, as opposed to uh, keeping the slowdown, estimating slowdown just in the memory controller, which is an even more difficult problem, actually. Now, later work shows that you could actually do this uh, much simply compared, much more simply compared to these works. So the application slowdown model that I briefly mentioned earlier, I'm going to mention that later again. That's actually the state of the art on this topic. It's called the application slowdown model. It was published in micro 2015. That's why I don't want to spend a lot of time on exactly how these works estimate slowdown, et cetera. Okay, so how do you do the dynamic request trailing? Basically, the goal is to adjust how aggressively each core makes requests to the shared memory system. And there are two mechanisms. Uh, the miss buffer or miss status holding register quota controls the number of concurrent requests that are accessing the shared resources from each application. And request injection frequency controls how often memory requests are issued from the last level cache or to the last level cache from the, uh, to the shared cache, I should say, to, uh, from the MSHRs. And this uh, basically points out uh, what different trawling levels and different MSHR quotas and different requests uh, at different, at 100% at trawling level, basically you're not throttled. But at 2% throttling level, you may uh, have a quota of only two, and you can inject once every 50 cycles. Now, this table is nice. It also shows the downside of the sort of mechanisms. You need, to have, you need to come up with these tables and essentially tune them. And that's usually a problem with this sort of uh, source throttling approaches. It has these tables that you need to tune. Like, who comes up with this, right? How do you come up with this, Stephen? Unfortunately, Humans are, may not be great at coming up with these things, right? And internet is full of these things also. If you look at the internet congestion control algorithms, they're kind of similar. Like exponential back off, it should be shown to be good, but is it really good in a very scalable system? And people have been working on this for decades, of course, right? Uh, so that's the downside of this sort of request traveling mechanisms. You have a lot of uh, essentially um, uh, variables to optimize. And maybe machine learning can help this one, right? Okay, there's system software support. Uh, different fairness objectives can be configured by system software. For example, you could keep the maximum slowdown in check. You can, uh, uh, you can, you may, a system software may supply a target maximum slowdown. And uh, you, you want to basically make sure that estimated maximum slowdown is less than the target. And you throttle cores accordingly to achieve that target. Or you could keep the slowdown of particular applications in check. Uh, to achieve a particular performance target. So estimated slowdown of application I should be less than target slowdown of application I. So if you're actually calculating slowdowns reasonably accurately, you can do these things. And you can have support for thread priorities. You can weight the slowdown with the weight of the thread. So you can do basically similar things that we have discussed earlier, but this is a very configurable essentially. So the takeaways, I will not go into a lot of results, but this paper shows that source styling alone provides a better performance uh, provides better performance than the combination of smart cache and smart memory scheduling. Uh, and one of the reasons is decisions made at the uh, 
I think it was the Power BS memory scheduler over here, and the fair cache co contradict each other. The cache may be injecting a lot of requests uh, to the Power BS memory controller, and this may not uh, adapt uh, quickly. And it, it turns out uh, neither source throttling alone or a combination of a fair cache or smart and smart memory scheduling alone provides the best performance. So there's room for improvement combining them. And combined approaches are even more powerful, basically, combining source solving and resource-based interference control. Even though this paper doesn't show that, later papers show this. Okay. Any questions? Yes, please. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what's done here, but the, uh, it's really the throttling levels, the thresholds. Like, what, uh, what threshold do you set? Like, for example, uh, throttling slowly uh, may take a long time to adapt, right? You always change the uh, throttling quota uh, little by little every time you detect something. Uh, so that may not be optimal because that may get you uh, uh, to a better place much uh, slowly. Throttling fast, very aggressively on the other end, let's say you go from 100% to 2% very quickly. Uh, that may actually lose a lot of throughput in the system because maybe you should not go to 2%, right? And this is a distributed problem also. You have many cores uh, you need to decide to throttle. That's why the thresholds are difficult to set in general. Um, you could do that, but the downside over there is it's not taking into account the interference that's being caused, right? So we wanted to here uh, have a stronger substrate that takes into account the interference. So you may uh, all of the cores may be injecting a lot of requests, uh, but maybe the interference is not that bad, right? But yes, I agree that I think there could be other ways of doing it than just uh, than just uh, than actually computing slowdowns. If you, for example, somehow take uh, have counters to determine interference, you could feed it to the system, but maybe not determine the slowdown exactly. So it's a substrate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, it's uh, it's easy to implement in one sense because you don't need to change the memory scheduling algorithm and also the cache and also the interconnect. Uh, that's a big upside of source throttling. And it can be a general way of handling shared resource contention, as we have seen in internet. It can reduce the overall load and contention in the memory system, as we have seen in the load latency curve. The disadvantage, it requires, at least this particular case, requires slowdown estimations. It's difficult to estimate. And the general case of source throttling, thresholds almost always become difficult to optimize. Uh, like how much to throttle and when to throttle always becomes problematic because you're, you're, you're basically... Uh, threading a fine balance between uh, not overwhelming the system, basically reducing the interference, uh, and also uh, not losing a lot of throughput. Because if you throttle very aggressively, you underutilize, right? That's the idea. So, and, and you can see this in this curve also, right? If you look at this curve again, if you throttle uh, very aggressively, you're somewhere here. You're not supporting a lot of load. If you throttle very little, you're somewhere over here. You're supporting a lot of load, but the latencies are huge. So you really want to be somewhere over here. And adapting uh, uh, quickly versus slowly uh, is not, uh, basically, it's a, it's a matter of thresholds. And that those thresholds become difficult to optimize because this curve is also not static, right? This curve changes depending on the access patterns, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Yeah, basically, yeah. You get throughput loss due to too much throttling. And it can be difficult to find an overall, let's say, good configuration uh, sometimes. I think uh, internet, for example, wastes a lot of bandwidth because of this congestion control uh, today. And people have shown that. OK, there's more on source stalling in this paper. Uh, there's actually more. Uh, when we talk about interconnects, we'll see this a bit more. Uh, there's a lot of work. And this work, actually, we looked at the differences between the internet and many core interconnects. Because at some level, they're similar. But at other levels, they're extremely different from each other. Uh, uh, because you have a lot more control on a chip, and uh, energy becomes a much bigger problem, for example, in the, uh, on chip interconnect. So if you're interested in the difference between like uh, large networks and uh, small, like uh, many-core networks, this paper tackles that. 
Okay, now in the remaining time, let me go into thread scheduling very quickly. I will not go into a lot of detail over here, but there are works in this topic. Uh, let me give you uh, quick ideas. Basically, uh, this becomes a much bigger problem when you have many core systems. So with multi-core, clearly scheduling threads that interact with each other nicely is good, uh, like that, that don't destroy each other's performance in the memory controller. If two threads are uh, like low intensity, maybe schedule them together, but that may not utilize your memory really well. In the many core, this becomes an even bigger problem as this work shows. So one example, so uh, usually if you have a many core system, you have some sort of one chip network, which we will talk about. Let's assume that you have memory controls on the edges and let's assume that you have a shared cache bank. Uh, this particular application to get data from the shared cache bank, it needs to send a request. There's some routing algorithm that's employed and these are different uh, cores. It goes through the, let's say, net small routers associated with each core. And then it gets to the cache and the cache responds back. And if you get a cache miss, then the cache sends a request to the memory controller and the memory controller responds back and then you respond back to the core. So clearly uh, you're causing a lot of interference from here all the way to here, whenever you're doing uh, making these requests. Right? So a heavy application may be injecting a lot of other requests uh, that may actually delay uh, this particular application. As I mentioned, uh, we uh, there are works that show that you, latencies can shoot up significantly because one of the reasons is that low latency curve that I showed earlier. So you have a problem, basically. You have applications, and you need to schedule them uh, to different cores. How do you schedule them to different cores? Uh, there are many challenges over here. I'll give you a few of them. How do you reduce the communication distance? Because this distance, uh, if you can minimize this distance, they minimize the length of these green arrows, uh, service things as locally as possible, you reduce the interference as much as possible in that case, right? That's the principle of locality, if you will. If you always sit in your cache, you're not going to cause interference. If you always sit in your private cache, you're not going to cause interference to someone else. Okay, so that's the idea. How do you reduce communication distance? How do you reduce the destructive interference between applications? And how do you prioritize applications to improve throughput? I will not tackle everything over here, but this work actually proposes multiple different ideas. One is clustering. Clustering is actually very powerful. We will discuss it. It's very similar to memory channel partitioning, but now you're partitioning the network. Uh, this improves locality and reduces interference. And then you, whenever you partition, as I said, you run into some load balance problems, and you may need to rebalance things. A little bit. That's where the balancing, load balancing comes in to improve the utilization of the network as well as the memory controller. And then to reduce interference, maybe you need to isolate some applications that are very heavily vulnerable to interference. That's what this picture kind of shows. And then you need to decide how applications, how close are applications to the memory controllers. And here you can do utility based mechanisms, but this paper proposed a very simple method. So I will not go into a lot of this. Clearly, this is a lot, but I will show you the importance of clustering. So if you don't cluster, meaning if you don't partition uh, the data, uh, partition which parts of the system an application can access, then an application can access everywhere, right? As a result, it may cause a lot of interference. So clustering says, this is one way of clustering, basically. If your application is mapped over here, you could, you're going to only access stuff, shared cache over here, uh, and the memory controller over here. So you're not going to cause interference to other clusters. That sounds nice. So that's the idea. This improves locality uh, and it reduces interference space. If your system is very heavily loaded, that's, a, that's actually an even better idea. If your system is lightly loaded, it may not be a great idea, but there's all the downsides that we have discussed with memory channel partitioning again, right? This is a partitioning mechanism. So your bandwidth utilization may be imbalanced and your cache capacity is lower clearly, right? And your memory capacity is also lower. But if you actually do this, you get significant performance improvements. Uh, you can see this paper shows that a lot of the performance improvement, there's significant performance improvement, especially when the applications are quite memory intensive. So this buys you actually a lot of performance improvement. All of the other mechanisms buy a little bit more on top of it. So you can see that clustering actually is a powerful, let's say, technique uh, to reduce interference and improve locality. Uh, uh, and uh, other techniques on top of that build. And uh, if you want to know more about the other techniques, you can actually take a look uh, at the paper. There's also power evaluation in this work. Basically, uh, you, let me finish this and then I'll get to your question. But basically, clustering is good for power also uh, because it limits the communication distance. And whenever you're communicating long distances, you waste power plus interference that is caused by communication of, uh, through, uh, across long distances actually waste power. So you can see that the network power gets reduced significantly with this sort of application clustering plus other application mapping mechanisms. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So in this uh, in this particular work, we don't assume that there's communication, but in a later work, yes, it is possible for the clusters to communicate. Yes, you need to do that, otherwise. Uh, you, you may have different threads, right? Belonging to different applications communicating with each other in some way. Right? Yeah. Okay, so this is an example of application to core mapping. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you can actually make, uh, this is a one level of scheduler, this is a node scheduler. But then in data centers, you actually have a higher level scheduler that basically decides which applications should go to which node, right? So uh, there are actually higher level decisions that you may need to make. and uh, people have shown that interference in a single node matters when you do uh, scheduling. Like when you co-schedule virtual machines uh, in a data center, how do you maximize throughput? And people have shown that interference actually matters. I'm not going into details of it, but basically you may have data center schedulers that monitor and detect contention that happens in caches and the memory bandwidth. And it tries to they, uh, these schedulers may try to balance microarchitecture level resource usage. Again, uh, we don't have time. Uh, you can take a look at some papers. So the big advantage of uh, interference over threat scheduling is you can eliminate or minimize interference by trying to schedule symbiotic applications together as opposed to just managing interference. Again, this is different from prioritization. You basically control how much interference happens uh, by scheduling applications, hopefully nicely. It's less intrusive to hardware again. Uh, again, you may not need to modify hardware if, if your profiling information is there. But of course, uh, overheads are again high. You may, uh, whenever uh, applications change behavior, you may need to migrate threads and data between the cores and machines. So it's actually higher overhead than even data mapping potentially. And it doesn't work very well if all threads are similar and they interfere, right? So if, if all of your threads are very, very similar and they actually are heavy and they interfere with each other, it doesn't work. So you need to have some good amount of heterogeneity across the applications that you're scheduling onto machines. Okay, so that brings me to the end. We've covered all of this. Best is actually to combine all in some way. How would you do that? This is still an open problem. And we've covered a bunch of approaches. And I think the takeaway is that like smart versus dumb resources, there is no single best approach, basically. There are a bunch of other bunch of techniques we've covered, scheduling, throttling, partitioning, no single best technique for all workloads. Basically, different workloads benefit from different memory schedulers, uh, different mechanisms, uh, and usually combining different approaches is the best way, as we have shown in multiple works, because different approaches have different ways of uh, dealing with interference. I think we've discussed all of this. But what we did not cover, I will very quickly uh, mention this. The problem is actually even more complex, <laughs> because not every type of request is also the same. This actually, people are seeing this more and more, but modern systems do a lot of prefetching. Uh, hopefully, we'll cover prefetching next. Uh, but modern systems do a, a lot of prefetching. As a result, a lot of the requests that come to the memory controller, for example, are prefetches. Now, this poses another problem. You have a demand request from one application that you know is useful, and you have a prefetch request from another application that you don't, you may not know it's useful. In fact, in many systems, you don't even know that's a prefetch request. <laughs> so how do you prioritize these things? So this actually becomes really important in shared resource management, not just the memory controller, but also caches. How do you manage a shared resource in term, when you have different requests? This, uh, this also, I think, goes into uh, what we have discussed earlier. How critical is a request, right? Uh, ideally, you would like to somehow understand the criticality uh, of a request for performance or energy, but let's start with performance. And if, can you actually uh, identify the criticality of a request and use that in decision-making? We've done that in the multi-thread applications, but I think going forward, we need to do more of that. Uh, Prefetch is just one example, right? Prefetch may be critical, actually. Prefetch, if the prefetch is correct, I mean, meaning it's accurate, it's going to save a bunch of latency for that application. If you delay that, that may be a very bad idea, right? So in that sense, it may be a critical request. It may be even more critical compared to the demand of an application because if you delay this application, this application is going to utilize its core. If you, if you actually prioritize this prefetch, this application is going to utilize its core. So don't ever think of a prefetch as necessarily a bad thing. It should not be automatically delayed. So th there are works that are showing that. Uh, so DRAM controller co-design is actually important. Uh, I don't have time to go into it. Cache interference management. We have not covered any of the cache interference management except some of the later works. Interconnect interference management. Hopefully we'll cover that. We didn't, we didn't talk about write to read scheduling. Uh, we, talk, we didn't talk about DRAM design much uh, except for the decoupled DMA. 
and interference and quality of service in more data-centric, uh, memory-centric systems. So there's a lot of work, in my opinion, that needs to be done. And as Google Google paper also shows, there's a lot more work that needs to be done clearly because apparently we're limiting the benefits of high-performance networking by doing uh, by having contention in the memory controller, right? Uh, this is a similar observation as we're limiting the benefits of out-of-order execution by having contention in the memory controller, right? Uh, so basically, there's a lot more uh, interesting uh, things that to be researched here. And also, a lot of these have very high product applicability. A lot of the memory quality of service go into SOCs. These techniques go into SOCs, actually. And I believe, as I mentioned earlier, use of machine learning techniques to manage resources is going to be even more important. And more end-to-end -end approaches to quality of service, predictability, and performance in complex systems, because systems are getting more complicated. And we need to see the systems as complicated and develop techniques for these complicated systems. I think these two go along well also, because if the systems are getting complicated, probably heuristic methods to determine those thresholds like we discussed are not going to work very well. I think I'm done and we're out of time also. So you can save your questions for tomorrow. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>